I'm on a mission to get every human being in the world to add one simple thing to their morning routine. And it is called the high five habit. And here's what it is. Every morning after you brush your teeth and you get that gunk out of your mouth so you're not spreading that nasty breath everywhere, okay? I want you to take a moment, put your toothbrush down and look at the human being in the mirror. That's not your reflection. That is a human being who needs you. A human being who's beaten down, who feels forgotten, who is so sick and tired of your criticism. And I want you to just stand there and look at them and take a moment because the rest of your day is going to be about everybody else. And then I don't want you to say a thing. This is the genius of this habit. You can be on your lowest morning, which I was when I, again, divine in intervention or stupidity. You can be the judge, right? It was April 2020, and I was uh, having a moment in my life where I just felt overwhelmed by life. I was waking up. The anxiety had come back. I felt like life was unfair. I had lost my dream job. Um, we were in the middle of the pandemic. My kids were in a state of huge grief and anger and frustration because university, you know, had closed and, you know, now they're dealing with it. Um, I had a bunch of speed, like all of a sudden my business is imploding. And, you know, don't forget just over 10 years ago, I was in a crisis financially where my husband and I were about to lose every, we couldn't even pay for groceries. My dad was lending us money. Yeah. And so it was triggering all of that. And I was thinking this, like, what the, I've worked so hard. I'm a good person. Like, I'm. how could you be doing this to me? Like, I don't deserve, like, just. And, and you you were pretty successful at that point oh already, right? God, successful? You know I was what? the number one motivational, female motivational speaker in the world. I had a daytime syndicated talk show yeah. in the United States, so 175 shows a year giving advice. I, um, you know, had the five second rule book, which was self-published and a huge millions of copies sold. Um, but I think that's the powerful thing about this story. Even with all that success, mm -hmm. you were still racked with self-doubt and anxiety and of negative course, thoughts. Because I hadn't had the biggest breakthrough of my entire life yet. And I had it yeah. one morning in April of 2020. You see, the five second rule is extraordinary, but it doesn't address what I believe is everybody's fundamental issue. And everybody's fundamental issue is that you either hate yourself or you do nothing but judge yourself. And this habit of relentless self-criticism and relentless self-rejection is the reason why you're unhappy. It's the reason why you're never satisfied. It's the reason why you can't take a compliment and why you're uncomfortable feeling celebrated. And it all comes down to the fact that when you stand in front of the mirror every single morning, you have this really subtle way that's not so subtle of starting your day by rejecting yourself. And I'm going to unpack this because it's unbelievably powerful when you start to truly understand this. Because if you can't look in the mirror and authentically see a human being that you respect, that you encourage, that you like, that you're cheering for, I'm going to even leave love off the table. Because I think that is so unattainable for where people are right now, let's just go with, can you accept yourself? Can you like yourself? Can you see a person that's worthy of support, worthy of your encouragement? Can we just start with that baseline? Because for my research, the average person cannot. From my research, 50% of men and women do not or cannot look at themselves in the mirror because they are either disgusted by the person they see or they are disappointed by them. And for those of us that can look in the mirror, we're still rejecting ourselves because we focus on what we don't like 
or we start to mindlessly think about all the things that we haven't done right or that we didn't do yet. You know, on this particular morning, April 2020, I'm overwhelmed by my life. I drag myself into the bathroom. I immediately see my reflection and I'm like, oh, God, you look like hell. I start ticking off all the things, the saggy neck, one boob lower than the other, like, you know, how exhausted I look, the gray hair coming in, how old I'm starting to seem. Yeah. And then the mind, once it goes negative, keeps going in that direction, unless you're five, four, three, two, one, not thinking about that. But so my mind's like going down the drain. I'm like, why'd I get up so late? I got a Zoom call in eight minutes. God, you didn't even, you know, text him back yet. And the dog still needs to be. And I'm like the beat down, the boom, boom, boom starts. And, you know, I don't know what came over me. But that morning standing there, yeah. could not think of his thing to say. And here's the important part. When you feel like shit, when you're overwhelmed by your life, you're not going to believe a pep talk anyway. Because it doesn't match how you feel. And so for whatever reason, I literally just raised my hand and I high five the woman that I saw in the mirror because she looked like she needed a high five. She looked like she needed somebody to say, it's going to be okay. You can do this. Get out there. And, you know, from that very first one, you know, it wasn't like lightning came crashing through the ceiling and, you know, stuck me in the head. That's not what happened. But there's definitely a switch inside each and every one of us. Yeah. So, like, think about the walls here. Yeah. Even when the lights are off, there's electricity in these walls. Even during your worst moments, there is vitality ripping through your veins. There is an electrical life force within you. And life can turn that switch off, but it's still there. There was something about this high five action that felt like a flip, like the switch flipped on and all of a sudden the energy could connect back and something inside me turned on. Now, that first morning, I didn't go, yeah, like that's not what happened. I just felt this sort of shift from to, all right, you got a roof over your head, you know, your, your, your family's healthy, yeah. you've, you've saved money. It's not that bad. Yeah. Get out there. Like, I didn't even think those things. It was more like the electricity, the, the energy in me, this vitality kind of kicked in. But it was the second morning where the profound nature of what I was stepping into really kicked in. So I wake up, anxiety, ankles right up the legs, feel like the rush of, oh God, something's wrong. Five, four, three, two, one, I get out of bed. I start walking to the bathroom and it's as I'm walking to the bathroom, I'm not even in there yet, that I feel something I have never felt in my entire adult life. And it's this. You know when you're about to go to a um, cafe and you're going to meet somebody you're really excited to meet, right? Yeah. Or, or somebody you really love, you know, you're going to see them. Yeah. What do you feel, right, as you're about to walk in the cafe? You're excited. You're, you're upbeat. You know, you're anticipating something good happening. Yeah. I actually realized I was feeling that way about seeing myself. Yeah. Now, I'm 53 this year. I don't think until that morning in April 2020, I had ever had an experience as an adult of being excited to see the human being Mel Robbins. I've been excited to see an outfit or a haircut or the way a new eyeshadow might look. But the human being, the way our kids, when they're really, really little, just love the sight of themselves, this unconditional support and celebration that's hardwired in your DNA when you're born. Yeah. And so as I rounded the corner that second morning, that's when the profound nature of this started to really hit me. And I stood there and I stared at the woman in the mirror and I realized I don't think I've ever asked myself the question, what does she need for me today? I've never joined in partnership with myself. I have been so busy trying to get shit done, trying to make sure people like me, trying to make sure the bills are paid, trying to make sure everybody else is okay, trying to do all this stuff that is the stuff of our lives that I have forgotten about the most important person, and that is myself. And again, I'm going to go back to a point that, that 
you know, we have been talking about kind of in various ways, which is we all know that we're supposed to love ourselves. We all know that we're supposed to be kind to ourselves. You can yeah. read a quote on Instagram, Instagram. You should talk to yourself like your best friend. The problem is how? You know, you read a quote like that. You're like, no shit, Sherlock. How do I do it? I mean, like, what? Seriously? Right? How do you do that? I don't know. I've been beating the shit out of myself for years. How do I stop doing it? I don't know. And, you know, here's the thing. Like, logically, we know it's stupid because if beating yourself up, being hard on yourself, rejecting yourself, trashing yourself, if it actually worked, we'd all be millionaires. We'd have rock star bodies. We'd have the best marriages on the planet. We'd never have to work a day in our life. We'd be on a beach somewhere. Like, it would work. Yeah. But instead, we have these patterns of thinking and small patterns of behavior, like not looking in the mirror at yourself is a form of rejecting yourself. Picking yourself apart is a habit of rejecting yourself. And so when you start your day like that, which you do, and then you go out into the world having rejected your very being, this is the reason why you are so thirsty for everybody else's validation. This is the reason why you are seeking your worth in the money that you make, in the car that you drive, in the, the downloads that you get, in the likes that you have, in the neighborhood that you live in. You think your worth is outside of you. And I'm here to tell you the secret to your fucking life is grab that worth and bring it back home. Start practicing a physical habit, an action that demonstrates to your brain that you respect yourself, that you believe that you're worthy, that you deserve forgiveness, that you deserve encouragement, that you believe in you. And as you start to practice the physical action, the universal symbol for I got you, I love you, I celebrate you, I see you, I believe in you. When you practice this physical action, the neuro association that is already in your brain with the high five to yourself in the mirror takes over. It's insane how this works. The science is mind-blowing. I think this is a thousand times more powerful than the high five habit because it cuts down to the core of who you are. You think you think it's more powerful than the five, four, three, two, one habit? Hell yes, I yeah. do. Hell yes, because the five, four, three, two, one is a tool that will push you to take action. Five, four, three, two, one is a tool you use to cut off the worries that trigger anxiety. 54321 is a tool that you use to create a moment of objectivity and control when you're normally triggered so you can consciously choose a different response. Yeah. The high five habit goes all the way down to the core of who you are and how you treat yourself. And when you become a human being who has compassion for yourself, who likes you, it won't matter what happens out there. Yeah. Because everything in here is healed and taken care of. And so like, you know, somebody can say to me, I don't love you anymore. I don't like you. It'll sting, but it doesn't change the fact that I still like myself because yeah. I practice and demonstrate it. That's the difference. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, the hidden magic in the high five habits is because I've been trying it the last few days, right? You... And what did you experience? It, it is powerful because. Well, walk us through like you're you standing at to, your bathroom sink yeah, and you, walk us through your experience. Well, first of all, you have to take a pause from your life. Whatever you were going to do, it requires an intentional pause to go, no, I'm going to now do this action for myself. And I've got to say, before I tell you how it went, I think it would have been very different for me a few years ago because mm. I feel self-compassion, you know, not seeking your worth from outside, from other people, from download numbers, likes, what people say about you, which was a huge part of my life. Mm -hmm. I feel that having put a lot of that to bed now and really feeling that I actually like the person I see in the mirror these days. So I kind of feel five years ago, I would have had a different experience with it, but it was still powerful because you are just looking at yourself and you're, you're putting your hand on the mirror 
And I think what it is, it's just that pause, that moment of seeing me. Like you are seeing yourself. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know, you know, obviously as a guy, what do we do? We often looking in the mirror. Um, we might be looking at our beard as we're shaving, <laughs> yeah. right? But you're not looking at your eyes, mm -hmm. right? You're just looking at, oh, I need to shave. Oh, I missed a bit here. Let me get rid of that. And then you crack on, right? Or you, you look at your face and your hair, but you're not really looking at yourself. Right. You're, you're, you're seeing your silhouette. You're, you're, you are seeing yourself, but you're not seeing yourself, if that yes. makes sense. Yeah. And that's what I think was really powerful was that it's just another, like, I feel it's just another tool now, which is going to take me all off two seconds, if that's five seconds tops. It's not as if I don't have time to add that in. There's no harm in adding it in. And frankly, I like adding it in. It makes me feel good. It's like, oh, and, and I think that's what you say. It's the action. Yeah. You don't have to say anything if you're not in the mood well, to I say anything. I don't want you to say anything, actually. And the reason why is the neuro association. So um, what do you mean by that? Well, here's what I mean by that. So um, when you high five someone else, what does the action of a high five communicate? It's it's just a universal symbol of um, you got this. I see you. You're great. We can do this. You know, it depends on the situation, but it's it's a good feeling. It's a mutual sort of validation type mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. experience. What did they? What tell me about the London Marathon and getting high fives? Oh, I mean, what did, what did a stranger's high five mean to you? It it just gave you like. And that's the key, it's strangers, right? You don't know them and they're looking at you and you're looking at them. Or you don't even, maybe you're not even looking at them. You just went through, you give a high five. It's it's like you've taken a shot of feel goods. Um, it's validation. It's like, hey, you know what? We're in this together. Um, you're standing at the side cheering. I'm running. But at that moment, it was like common humanity. It was like, there was no animosity. And actually, it's kind of one of my big learnings from the London Marathon actually was, and it relates to this, I think, is that that's kind of who we are. Like in in what is considered a very divided world at the moment, I went and did the London Marathon and all I saw was love, strangers giving love to other people mm -hmm. that they didn't know, right? And how did they give that love? Through cheering, but more often than not, with a high five. Correct. It is a universal symbol of encouragement, yeah. of love, of celebration. And the neuro association, whether you live in a culture where you've been high-fived or not, the neuro association is still there because you have seen them in sport. Yeah. You've seen them in marathons. You've seen teachers give them to kids. So your brain has a lifetime of programming in your subconscious that is triggered by this action. It is neurologically impossible to high five yourself and think you're a loser. You failed. I don't like your face. Your brain will not allow yeah. you to do it because the neuro association is so entrenched. It has only ever meant, I celebrate you. I see you. I got you. Keep going. You got this. I'm behind you. It, you know, as you say that, Mel, it makes you think of gratitude, because when we are feeling grateful, we can't feel down, we can't feel anxious, we can't feel annoyed with ourselves. And in some ways, this is kind of gratitude for ourselves. Correct. Because the thing about gratitude, which obviously has tremendous, demonstrated, proven benefits in your life. Most of us are grateful for things outside of us. Yeah. What I'm teaching the world to do is to unlock neuro association in your mind and in your nervous system and aim it back at yourself and use this simple habit to interrupt the critic, to break the default loops in your mind associated with judgment, shame, criticism, hatred for self, and to replace it with a new default setting of seeing yourself the way you see your child, which is love. Yeah. Like my kids do stuff that piss me off all the time. 
And I can be upset with them or disappointed with them, but I never stop loving them. Yeah. And there is something that has happened to each and every one of us that is life's pains and heartaches and disappointments and setbacks sort of stack up. We stop loving ourselves. We start judging ourselves more. We start condemning ourselves more. We start rejecting ourselves more. We start trying to seek somebody else's love and approval in order to fill up this well inside of us that we've been digging because yeah. we've been rejecting ourselves. And so, you know, it's so powerful because the action alone is what communicates it. If you're looking at yourself and you raise your hand on your hardest days, what the high five says is not, yeah, I'm amazing. Like, this is not going to turn you into a narcissist. This is grounded in compassion. Yeah. This is basically saying, I see you. You're right. This is hard. And you know what? You can do this. And I'm going to be here. And I've got your back. And when you send yourself into your day with that physical action, it leaves an imprint in your mind and spirit. Now, there's a couple reasons why. I don't even write about this part in the book because I didn't know this until I started doing podcasts for the book. Yeah. So Dr. Amen um, told me, who's you know one of the leading experts in the brain, that one of the reasons why you feel better when you do it, no matter how terrible of a morning it is, is because your brain has always given you dopamine when somebody else high fives you. Yeah. So these sorts of gestures are rewarded in the brain. So when you simply high five yourself, your brain doesn't distinguish between me high fiving me and me high fiving you. It just sees, oh, I know what that is. Drip, dopamine. Oh, yeah. I believe in that person. The second thing that happens is that your body is hardwired for celebratory energy. This is that electricity that's in the walls yeah. that has a switch that you can turn on and off. And so, you know, for example, if you, when you cross the finish line of the London Marathon, what do you instinctively do? High five someone. Yeah. And raise your hands, right? When your favorite team scores, raise yeah. your hands. When you yell surprise at a birthday party, you raise your hands. When you say hello, you raise your arm. When you go to high five somebody, you raise your arms. Yeah. When you hug somebody, you raise your arms. This is wired through your entire body. And normally we give that celebratory energy to other people or things. Yeah. I'm here to tell you when you high five yourself, you flip the switch. You flip the switch and give yourself a little bit of that vitality that's coursing through you to help you move into your day. Yeah, I see it as um, almost like it is about the high five, but it's not in many ways as well, because it's like if you're going down a road and the high five to yourself sets you off on a different path for the rest of that day compared to had you not done it, right? A thousand percent right. So let's just use a great example that everybody can, can latch on to. Sport. Yeah. So if a team is about to play the championship in the league, right? Yeah. And they're the underdogs. What is the best way to send the team into that game? Is it to be to beat them down? Oh, you did a terrible job on the London Marathon. You're going to face plant in New York. Oh, my God. And I saw your split times. We're fucked. No, that's not the best way to do it. But that's what we do to ourselves. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And so I'm here to say, you don't have to say anything because you're not going to believe it. So we're going to cheat this. We're going to circuit your you're feelings. You're bypassing Correct. words. It's like when you take like <laughs> this ridiculous example, but it's like when you, um, you take a B12 supplement, but you take it sublingually. So it dissolves. So you bypass having to go into the gut, through the liver, and then into the, you get it straight in. Correct. And it's kind of, it's got that feel to me. Thousand percent. And so you send yourself into the game of life with that sort of optimism, yeah. with that resilience, with that compassion. And, you know, look, some days you're going to laugh. Some days you might cry. Uh, people report some days you're going to just feel a little bit better. And some days you're going to high five yourself and laugh out loud from the <laughs> dopamine and walk into your boss's office and ask for that raise or quit. Because you're going to remember that no matter what, you're going to be okay. You're going to remember that no matter what, you got your own back. You're going to remember that it doesn't matter if nobody says great job at that presentation that you worked on because you can walk into the bathroom. As people have written to us, having practiced this, hey, I did a presentation at work. 
Nobody said a damn word. The old me would have walked into my cube and cried and thought I was getting fired. I knew I did a good job. I walked into the bathroom and high five myself. Your kids can stick this in their back pocket. And it's a way to reset yourself when you start going down that negative road. And why is this important? It's important because the high five is not going to remove poverty. It's not going to remove discrimination. It's not going to remove diabetes. It's not going to remove uh, the fact that somebody just said they want to divorce you. It's not going to remove all of the trauma. It doesn't change those things. It changes you. Yeah. And it changes your relationship with yourself and your ability to believe that through your actions and your attitude, you can move the needle on those things. Yeah. I, I, I love that last point, Mel, because the similarities between the way you talk about this and the way I've been talking about certain behaviors and five minute habits for years, mm. they are so connected. And one of the things I often say, and I want to just acknowledge you for what you just said, it's it's not going to change your life situation. You know, if you're if you're in poverty, you're still going to be in poverty, but you're going to be a different person. You're going to be better able to face the stresses that are in your life. Yes. And, and I think this is such an important point, right? Because I have said this before on the show, but but I, but I always think it's worth reiterating that a lot of people feel that self-help or wellness is the preserve of the wealthy and the middle classes. But actually habits like this, yes, they'll help someone who's got a ton of money in their bank accounts, because a lot of people like that are are racked with self-doubt on the inside as well. But it's also going to help someone who is in poverty or a single mom who's working two jobs and has got three kids and is really struggling. That little micro moment each morning where she sees herself in the mirror. She signals to her brain that she is worthy, that actually she's a human being with real feelings and for all her qualities and all her, you know, all the great things that she's doing, that has power, right? Oh my and God, it is free. Power. It is free. There's free. not a single person <laughs> pretty much who is listening to this or watching this right now who couldn't just either pause or at the end go, all right, let me, uh, I'm, I'm convinced, Mel. Like, oh, I'm going to give this a go. I'm yeah. going to give this a go. Yeah. Well, first of all, don't rush it. Don't rush it. So don't go into the bathroom and slap the mirror and be like, I didn't feel anything. Um, I want you to, again, as you so rightly put, take a minute and just look at yourself. Because for most people, that's the hardest part. I mentioned that, you know, I get smarter And I learned so much from every comment and people that write their stories in. And one person, uh, Allison Bird, a friend of mine, who made my ability to explain the depth of this so much deeper because she said one thing to me when she tried it before the book came out. She said, you know, I think it's working. I kind of feel, I feel energized. I said, but you know what surprised me, Mel? I said, what? She goes, the resistance. I said, the resistance? What are you talking about? She's like, oh, first couple of days I did this, I stood in front of that mirror and I, there was something in me that's like, I didn't, I couldn't even raise my hand. There was this resistance. And so I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And so I, of course, put something out, hey, to the 700,000 people on the newsletter list, anybody trying this and feel any resistance? We write to everybody that's in our little test group. Anybody feel, holy cow. There, it turns out that most people do not have an immediate positive, oh, I'm doing this yeah. reaction. Most people have massive resistance to even trying it. And I want to explain why, because this is extraordinarily sad. And it also is an enormous opportunity for growth, because I believe, based on having 136,000 people go through a five-day challenge online that we're monitoring in an app from 91 countries and seeing what they're reporting, I know that this takes five days to work, five days before you have an enormous breakthrough in how you see and relate to yourself, five days before the chemical, physiological, neurological, physical, and psychological change starts to go 
holy cow, this is crazy. This works like this. And so the resistance comes from self-judgment yeah. and self-condemnation. And I'm going to tell you a story to drive this home. For people who stand in the bathroom mirror when they try the high five habit and they feel this resistance in their body. First of all, let me say, it's really normal to think this is weird because it is, okay? It, it just sounds so cheesy. I, for those of us that grew up with Saturday Night Live, you're gonna think of Stuart Smiley. You know, I'm nice, people like me, that skit they used to do about the guy who talked to himself in the mirror. You're gonna stand there and go, seriously, Dr. Charlie and Mel Robbins, you two have lost your mind, but okay. If it's weird as you do it, that's a sign it's working. Yeah. So Dr. Leaf told me, oh, well, that's what it feels like when a new neural pathway is getting plowed. So if it feels weird, good, because we're teaching you to do the opposite of criticizing yourself. Yeah. But the resistance is something else. The resistance is the fact that every morning as you start your day, you drag your entire past into the bathroom with you. And... If you're somebody who has experienced trauma or been abused or abandoned or neglected or grew up with chaos and addiction, or you've been the victim of a crime, or you're constantly having to deal with discrimination or violence, all stuff that you're not responsible for, there are a lot of people who take all of that from their past. And when they look at themselves, they see somebody who's damaged. They see somebody who's unworthy. They see somebody who is unlovable because of those things. And what the high five starts to become when you do it is it becomes literally an act of defiance. It becomes an act of strength. It becomes a sign that I'm a survivor. It becomes permission to heal. It becomes this deep sense of feeling and knowing where you are and the fact that you have an extraordinary future despite all of the pain and suffering that you have endured and survived. And then there are people that bring everything they regret, all the shame, all the regret, all the, so the cheating, the lying, the stealing, yeah. the hurt you've caused yourself or other people, the missed opportunities. And boy, did I get an unbelievable example of this in my own life. So, you know, I was doing the high five habit myself. And during the early days of the pandemic, my husband had just been diagnosed with depression and he's a super healthy guy. He is a certified Buddhist meditation instructor. Uh -huh. He leads men's retreats called soul degree. He's a yoga instructor. He's wildly involved with our community yeah. and with our family. He's a super high functioning guy, but it's just, he's just felt heavy. He's, there's been like a cloud there, like a heaviness to him, like no, there's no light between his eyes. And yeah. so thankfully, you know, his therapist uh, finally got him to go see a psychopharmacologist and somebody to do the advanced testing. They're like, dude, you have dysthymia. You have like really long-term depression. Like you're lucky you've been doing all this stuff because it's kept you alive. And you know, I turned to him at one point, I've been doing this for a couple of days or a couple of weeks rather. And I'm like, you know, I know I'm not your doctor and I know I'm not an expert in your mental health, but I really think you should try this high five thing. I really think it's going to help you with this depression. He's like, I'm not high five. It is the stupidest thing. I don't care what you're doing. No. And I'm like, okay, if you won't do it for yourself, would you just do it for me? Would you do it for five days? Cause we're in the middle of researching this now. And I like, I, I haven't even shared it with my audience yet. And I'm kind of like writing down in my journal what I'm feeling. And I've got a couple people on the team. Would you just do it for me? He's like, all right. So he kind of did the first one, like, are you happy? You know, typical <laughs> spouse thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know. So he did it for five days. And then I asked him what he thought. And he said, you're on to something really big. And I said, why do you say that? And um, I had no idea how dark my husband's thoughts were. I had no idea how much he was condemning himself, how much shame he felt. Um, I knew that he was struggling with depression. I had no idea 
that for the past seven years, the man who has stood next to me at the bathroom sink next to me would look up at the mirror and see a person that he hated. He saw a person that had failed. He believed that since the restaurant business didn't work, and since it left us 800 grand in debt, and that his wife had to go out and make the money, that he was the world's worst father, the world's worst husband, and he has been condemning himself every day for seven years. And the reason he thought the high five was stupid is because you only high five people you care about. You only high five people who are winning. And he, of all people, didn't deserve it. And for me, you know, I knew that he was struggling with shame around the restaurant business. I knew he was struggling with the amount of debt that we had and the fact that, you know, he had, you know, the investors lost money. Like for me, I had a totally different experience. I'm like, you guys worked at that for eight years? You made your investors whole? Like, you know, like, hello, entrepreneurship? Like, you know, we wouldn't have the five second rule without it. Are you kidding? Like, woohoo, we're winning. This is amazing. Like I didn't, his business partner had the same, like he was proud of what they built, proud of how hard they worked. Chris, for whatever reason, that was not his story. Yeah. His story was condemnation, regret, shame. He could only see a failure. And, you know, what was wild about that is, you know, I've for years talked Chris up. I've for years have told him how proud I am of him. I, you know, he's, he was the CFO of the business as my company, as the company was taking off. Yeah. Like he owns half of it. Like he's an integral part of everything. Yeah. He doesn't see it that way. And that's an important part. Yeah. Nobody can heal you. Nobody can change how you talk to yourself. This is an inside job. And so if you relate to how my husband feels, I want you to understand that what Chris said to me was that this high five and pushing through the resistance is an act of forgiveness. It's an act of healing. It's an act of support and compassion that allows you and shows you that you are giving yourself permission to feel good again, that you deserve to be happy, that you deserve and that you can continue to push on and go do better and be better and feel better. And that of all people, you're going to stop judging you. Today, what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking about the powerful connection between your mindset and your morning routine. And I'm going to give you an assignment at the end of this training. Tomorrow, we're going to build on this. So this entire week, what we're going to be talking about are the components to your morning because your mindset and having a powerful mindset and being deliberate about what you're going to think about and what you're not going to think about, it begins the moment you wake up. And believe it or not, how you wake up, not when, but how you wake up and the first few things that you do in the morning will dictate your mood for the rest of the day, which based on science is going to impact your productivity and it's going to impact how you feel about your life. And it will also impact your mindset for the rest of the day. And that's why now that we've done in days one, two, three, four, and five, we've done foundational training. You've learned a tremendous amount about how your brain works, about your default network, about how to be a deliberate thinker. You've spotted your limiting beliefs. You've learned how to think this, not that. You've started the skill and the practice of the skill. Remember, it's a process, not an event, to be a positive thinker. Um, you've started practicing, catching your limiting beliefs and swapping from that default way of viewing the world and thinking about yourself and choosing deliberate thoughts. Now let's talk about physical habits that you can adopt that are very simple, that will be life-changing because they will impact your ability to be in control of what you're thinking and to be deliberate. And that begins with how you wake up. So let me talk about the morning. 
you can think about your morning routine and whether or not you even have one in the exact same way that we think about the brain. You're either defaulting to something that you've always done that may not, no longer serve you, or you're getting deliberate and choosing to do something that's more positive and powerful because you deserve it. And that starts with your morning routine. So if you're the kind of person where the alarm goes off and you hit the snooze and then the alarm goes off again and you hit the snooze and you know eventually you roll out of bed and you step into your day and you maybe drink a big dark cup of coffee and you skip breakfast and you skip exercise and you're tired, if that's how you start your day, your mindset is going to be impacted by that. If your alarm goes off and you immediately reach for your phone and you start scrolling through Instagram while you're in bed and looking at Facebook and you are putting all kinds of stuff in your brain that triggers FOMO, that triggers insecurity, that triggers anxiety, that is going to impact your mindset for the rest of the day. And so starting tonight, I want you to take control and be more deliberate about your habits in the morning. And what we're going to do this week is we are going to build, based on science, the most powerful morning routine that you could possibly have. Sorry, I'm just moving this around so that the Instagram channel is brighter. The most powerful morning routine that you could possibly have based on science. It's super simple. It will help you become a more deliberate and positive thinker. And I'm going to walk you through step by step. And you're going to be doing this with more than 230,000 people around the world. So what is the assignment tonight? The assignment tonight is very simple and you're going to hate it. You're totally able to do this and most of you are not going to. You're going to let your limiting beliefs and your default mode of thinking stop you from making this simple change. And the thing that I want you to do tonight, this is your assignment. This smartphone right here, I don't want it anywhere near your bedroom. Your assignment is when you go to bed tonight, you are to plug your smartphone in outside of your bedroom. If you live in a studio apartment, put it on the other side of the room. I don't want this phone anywhere near where you sleep. And there's a simple reason why you're addicted to it. And if it's next to you while you're sleeping, as soon as you wake up, without even thinking, the default mode of your brain will mindlessly reach for this and you will lie in bed and you will look at your phone. And when you do that, you are putting in garbage into your brain before you even get out of bed. If you wake up anxious, if you wake up overwhelmed, if you wake up feeling like you're losing some imaginary race, if you wake up and you feel dread, if you wake up and feel negative or exhausted, I'm telling you, this is the reason why. And if you want to have a positive mindset this year, and you deserve to, then you also have to get very deliberate about your habits and about your morning routine in particular. Because how you wake up matters. How you wake up determines your mood. How you wake up determines on your phone. Hold on. IG is pausing a lot. Hold on a second. Let's see here. Um, yikes. All right. Hold on a second. IG, uh, I'm getting a lot of, uh, let's get on Wi-Fi. Rendezvous. Let's see if that works. Looks like I'm on. Let's go back to Instagram. Okay, let's see if that works. Is that better, Mandy? Um, thank you for your patience, by the way. Normally, our streams are not as spotty, but when we started this program, I knew that I was going to be traveling 24 out of the 35 days that we we're broadcasting live, and tech can be a challenge. And so for those of you that have been hanging in there on Instagram, if it's spotty, jump over to Facebook Live, jump over to YouTube, jump over to Twitter. We're streaming on all four platforms at once. Um, and we will also email you a link to this video, which is one of the reasons why, if you haven't yet, sign up for melrobbins.com slash mindset reset, because we curate all this information for you and we tee it up for you every day. 
Um, so thank you for your patience as I am broadcasting from uh, my parents' place. My mother's 70th birthday is tomorrow. And um, for those of you that are just tuning in because the stream has been dicey, we're talking about the powerful connection between your mindset and your morning routine. In fact, I would say it's not even powerful, it's critical. You cannot have a positive in control mindset if you don't have control of your mornings. And it makes a lot of sense from a common sense standpoint, right? If you wake up and you're behind the ball and if you wake up and you've got your phone in your face and you're not even out of bed yet and you're looking at uh, everybody's perfect life on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter or you're reading the news and getting stressed out, you're absolutely positively not going to start your day off right. So the assignment that I have for you is a very simple one, and it's one that you're going to be tempted to ignore. Do not ignore this. Tonight, when you go to bed, you are to put your phone as far away from your bed as you possibly can. If you have a bedroom, get your phone charging outside of your bedroom. Turn the vibration off, and you can turn the ringer on. Um, and here's why. I know many of you are single parents. I know um, many of you have jobs where people need to get a hold of you. Uh, Instagram is reconnecting again, so I don't know what to make of this. Um, I apologize for the feed on Instagram, everybody. Uh, but if you, if you start your day by looking at this, your mind is hijacked and you're going to be playing catch up all day long. I want to give your brain a fighting chance to be deliberate. Tonight, what I want you to do is sleep without your phone. Plug your phone in outside of your room, and then when you get up, you're going to notice something. You're going to notice that you automatically reach for your phone. Your phone's not going to be there. You see, we're setting a trap. We're setting a trap so that you don't fall into the default mode of laying in bed and looking that thing. I want to give you a chance to catch your thoughts. I want to give you a chance to do a couple things in the morning based on science that will give you control over your day, that will boost your mood, and that will help you develop a much more deliberate and positive mindset. So you got it? If you're going to do this, I want you to put the, the uh, bicep pump curl you know, emoji or give me a thumbs up in the comments below if you're going to try this. Because it's a lot harder than you think. And even those of you that are like, oh, I don't look at my phone, baloney. Every one of us is addicted to this thing. I'd like to take some questions real quick about mindset, about the mindset um, morning routine connection, about the cell phone, or about anything related to mindset reset. Uh, Danielle from Facebook, I love routines as well, but what if you let go of your routine? Can you still embrace yourself and the day? I'm not sure I understand the question. I love routines as well. I think that, yes, you can, rec if what you're basically saying is you have a morning where you don't do your normal routine and now it's noon and you realize, my gosh, I've spent the day, the morning in a negative mindset. Can you catch yourself? Absolutely. You absolutely at any moment during the day can catch negative beliefs. You can catch limiting beliefs. You can catch yourself when you default to the negative things that you've trained yourself to think. And you can five, four, three, two, one in five seconds flat. You can switch to a more positive belief. Absolutely. You can change your attitude like that. No question. You can put the force fields up if you feel yourself getting sucked into somebody else's drama. What I'm trying to tell you is that while that's possible, and while you should do that all day, particularly as you are practicing the skill of having a positive mind, I am here to tell you, based on personal experience, that when you start to own your morning, and when you start to take your morning routine seriously as a habit that you develop that contributes to your mindset and your happiness and your sense of control, it will change your life. If you're concerned about anxiety, having a morning routine that I'm going to walk you through step by step this entire week, this is key to curing yourself of anxiety. And it begins the night before. So Betsy asked, is it better to prep the night before? Absolutely. So the night before, 
I um, always plug my phone into the kitchen or I plug it into my closet. I turn off the alerts on my text messages. I turn off the buzzing and I leave the ringer on in case there's some kind of emergency. My kids know that they should call me if they need to reach me. We have a daughter who's in college and, you know, kids are all over the place these days. My business partner knows, call me if you need to reach me. Do not text me. And that one habit has changed my mindset for the better. It's changed my life for the better because when I wake up in the morning, I actually get out of bed. I don't scroll through my phone. And because my phone is nowhere near me, I don't even reach for it. I spend the first 30 minutes to an hour of my day before I even look at my phone. And it has been a game changer, both in my ability to cure my anxiety and in my ability to be deliberate about what I want A, to be thinking about, and B, what I want to be focused on for this day. Um, uh, Tatiana on Instagram, I switch my phone to airplane mode or turn it off completely for the night. Is this okay or the equivalent? It's, it's definitely okay, but I don't want it near your bed because I don't even want you tempted to reach for this thing and to start scrolling through it. You, we, we live in a moment of time, here comes my father, where we need to have major boundaries with our phone. This right here, it's supposed to be a tool, but we have become the tool. Advertisers know that they can make money on your attention. So when you look at this, whether you're looking at your email or you're looking at Facebook or you're looking at social media, you are giving the world your most precious commodity, which is your attention. And so you're going to hear me hammer the fact that boundaries with this, essential for your mindset, essential for your happiness, essential for your success. Um, Vicki from Twitter, why is morning routine so important? What two to three items should be a part of it? Why is the morning routine so important? A couple things. How you wake up has a scientifically proven impact on your ability to focus, on your happiness, and on your productivity all day. This is not something I've made up. This is well-established research. And I'm going to be explaining it to you in bite-sized pieces all week long. And so to preview it, we're going to be talking about this tomorrow morning. The two to three pieces of it are, for me, I wake up when the alarm goes off. And I'm going to explain the science why the snooze alarm is uh, horrendous for your productivity. It actually impacts the way that your brain functions when you do it. We'll explain that in a training this week. I then get up, and for the first couple minutes of the day, I plan my day. And I have a particular process that I go through that leverages something from Harvard Business School called the Progress Principle. Uh, I have a mindfulness practice. That could be anything that you want. It could be gratitude journaling. It could be meditation. It could be five slow, deep breaths. It could be taking your, your dog outside for a walk. And then on mornings when I can, I have a micro exercise practice where I do planks for five minutes or I do something to get my blood pumping on the mornings that I can. I, and I do all that before I ever even look at my phone because I put myself and my mindset first deliberately before I ever allow the world access to my mind. You do not want anybody to have access to what's going on up here until you've gotten deliberate about what you're thinking about first. Um, so that's a preview, but I'm going to, as I promised, this was going to be bite-sized stuff. If you've, if you've already watched the first 10 minutes of this, you got the training for today, which is the powerful connection between your mindset and your morning routine. And your morning routine begins the night before when you plug your phone outside of your bedroom and you go to bed without your phone anywhere near you. Um, the other reason why that's important is we know based on research that the blue light on these things impacts your ability to fall into a deep sleep. Sleep is essential for you to have a healthy mindset. And also when you wake up, if this is next to you, 87% of adults sleep with their phones or next to their phones. And 33% of adults check email in the middle of the night. And so whether you're willing to admit that or not, we want to break your habit 
of giving the world access to your mind. And we want to make you more deliberate about how you are with your phone. And the reason why is it has a direct scientific researched impact on your mood and your mindset all day. Um, I have time for just one or two more questions. Uh, if you have any other questions about this, seeing a ton of, but my phone is my alarm, I have kids. Do you see the excuses, everybody? What's more important? If you have kids, do exactly what I told you. Leave the ringer on. If your kids need you, they can call you. If your boss needs you, they can call you. And this is really important for your kids too. You know, there's a lot of research about kids and phones and how they're hugely addicted. And the thing about kids and phones, particularly phones in their bedroom when they're going to sleep at night, is that if you have teenagers, teenagers are biologically hardwired to push away from their parents when they become teenagers. Their friends become their primary uh, support group. They become the most important thing in their life. And kids feel a obligation to stay connected to their friends. And they feel an obligation that if I'm not available for my friends, you know, that makes me not a good friend. And so to help your kids, you need to draw the boundaries for them. You need to tell them that they can't have their phone in the um, bedroom. You need to have a charging station in the kitchen and you need to model these very healthy and mandatory boundaries with technology, period. And so I get it. Your kids need to reach you. No problem. Plug it into the closet. Plug it into the bathroom. Turn the ringer on. If there's an emergency, they can call you. Yes, you can use your phone as your alarm. Plug it into the bathroom. Plug it into the closet. Plug it into the kitchen. Because if the alarm is going off outside of your bedroom or several paces away from your bed, guess what you're doing when the alarm goes off? You're getting up. And tomorrow... I'm going to explain the science behind why you need to get up when the alarm rings and why you should not hit the snooze alarm. I don't hit the snooze alarm because I understand the neurological impact that the act of snoozing has on your mindset, on your mood, and on your brain's ability to focus. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about tomorrow. The reason why you have to get up when the alarm rings, and it's not because it sounds like a good idea, it's because of the science behind how your brain works and what hitting the snooze button and drifting back to sleep for 15 minutes does to your mind. You're going to learn all about that tomorrow, and it is a game changer. So, Mandy and Danielle, do we have any other comments, questions, excuses? Give me the thumbs up if you're going to try this phone challenge. This is going to change your life. Try the phone challenge tonight. Give it one night. And I want you to notice as you do it, how drawn are you to your phone? How panicky are you that it's not near you? Do you feel anxious about it? When you wake up in the morning, are you immediately grabbing for it? I want you to notice the default mode that you have with this sucker right here. Because part of being deliberate and serious about being a healthy, happy, anxiety-free positive, confident thinker is taking control and having boundaries between the world and your mind. And it's also having the assuredness that you can live without this thing. What is your limiting belief? What is the thing that you think about yourself? Maybe your parents or your mother or your father taught you to think that way about yourself. Maybe you went through a horrible breakup and that person made you feel unworthy. Maybe you've had a bunch of uh, setbacks in your life and that's what gave you that limiting belief. But what is your limiting belief? Because today, what we're going to do today is we're going to take it a step further. Now that you've identified your limiting belief, we're going to look at what is it costing you to choose to repeat it. Because remember the quote I started with. You can, you have a choice right now. You get to repeat the things you've always done or you can evolve them and become more deliberate. Let's talk about the cost of that limiting belief. I'm going to go first. So 
write down your limiting belief. I see a lot of, I'm not good enough. My mental health is holding me back. I can't run a successful business. I'm lazy and I can't do anything. I'm not healthy enough. Money is the issue. I'm scared to fail. What is the limiting belief that you have? I, I'm certain it has something to do with not being enough. Once you've written that down, you're afraid of failure. You're not, you don't deserve success, all that kind of stuff. I don't know how to start. These are excellent. You're doing an excellent job. The first step to moving from that default into getting deliberate is actually seeing it. So seeing it is fantastic because now we can start to understand that, whoa, this got programmed in. It's my default mode. I want to get rid of it. How do we get rid of it? Well, let's first identify why you want to. Let's take a hard look at the cost, the cost of having this limiting belief. So in order to figure out the cost of having the limiting belief, what's my limiting belief? That I'm not a good person. That's my limiting belief, that I am not a good person, that you don't think I'm a good person, that I don't think I'm a good person. Um, and here's what you're going to do in order to identify the cost, okay? You're going to ask yourself three questions, and they're very simple. What is this limiting belief in my case that I'm not a good person? What does it cost me in my past to think this way? What is it costing me in this present moment to think that I'm not a good person? And here's the kicker. If I don't evolve this, if I don't get deliberate, what is it going to cost me in the future to continue to think that I'm not a good person? So in the past, thinking that I'm not a good person it did a bunch of things. First of all, it made me very sad. Secondly, it made me a liar because I assumed that I wasn't good enough and I'm not a good person. So I got to pretend to be somebody else. It also made me cheat on people because I didn't think I deserve love. And it also, by believing that I wasn't a good person, it somehow justified the bad behavior. I mean, if I'm a bad person, then I do bad things, right? What does it cost me in the present? to believe that I'm not a good person. Well, it costs me a lot of joy. It costs me connection and friendships because I'm constantly questioning whether or not people actually like me for me. Um, it makes me second guess myself and whether or not I deserve the success. And what does it cost me in the future? It's going to cost me everything. If I continue to repeat this pattern and I continue to allow myself to default to believing that I'm not a good person, I will never be fully happy. I will never be fully present. I probably will not be successful when we launch this new daytime talk show in the fall. Um, and so I got a choice to make and I want to get rid of this because I can see what allowing myself to believe that I'm not a good person is costing me. This exercise of, of identifying your limiting belief and then seeing what it's cost you in your past, your present, and your future is so important for you to do that I want to give you another example. So to really, really drive it home, okay? And so I want to bring in my husband. Why don't you scoot on this? I don't know if you can lean in on that thing. You sit, sit on this chair. I'm going to bring in my husband, Christopher Robbins. Yes, if you've ever been a fan of Winnie the Pooh, his name is Christopher Robbins. And Chris is going to go through this exercise too. And um, I think it's important for we're, 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 we're sharing a chair here. And so we're like really close. Um, I think it's important for you guys to know that uh, Chris uh, is one of the partners in our media company. He's our CFO and he's also the founder of a men's retreat called Soul Degree. And he's a yoga instructor and president of the Booster Club. So this is a guy that's like really accomplished um, and super amazing. So uh, with that context, founder of Soul Degree, what's your limiting belief? Well, of course, it would be appropriate <laughs> that I think forever it's just been that I'm not good enough, that I'm, I think that's it succinctly, that I'm not living up. And certainly in the past, it's been all around the decisions I've made career-wise um, never thinking that I was in fact good enough, which just took away from, I suppose, all the joy that I could have had. Were you really sad when you were little? Yeah, I think I was just down and out, probably feeling alone. And 
like the decisions I had made along the path were not the right ones. And then that subsequently not performing and, um, or at least not performing to my, my own expectation. Um, so how has not feeling good enough? I can see how it would make you feel sad, especially, you know, there's so much pressure on men to succeed, feeling like you weren't good enough in your career, blah, blah, blah. Even ski racing, because you grew up as a kid ski racing. How did you feeling not good enough impact the way you raced? I probably just could have skied a lot better than even I did because I was constantly thinking it wasn't good enough. And now what about in the present? What is the default belief that you're not good? Is it like, how is it still in your life in this moment? Because here's the thing about a limiting belief, guys, is that everybody will look at you on the outside and they'll be convinced you don't have it. They'll be shocked that you, you believe that about yourself. And that's why it's important for you to be honest with yourself about what your limiting belief is, because it's something you are doing to yourself. So what is it that, what is the belief that you're not good enough? How is that impacting your life right now, Chris? Uh, probably has everything to do with just being the point parent as much as I love being the point parent and having the time with the kids that I have given your own schedule. Let me explain what that means. So I, Chris and I have a, um, have Chris and I, because of the amount of work that I use, Chris is the one that is home more often. He's the one that is really in charge of what's going on with the kids. He, um, has been home for these last three to four years, playing a huge role in the back end of our company, but the primary role is the parent. And traditionally, at least in the United States, it's the woman that does that. And so it's been, I think, a very fulfilling yet confronting uh, thing for Chris to be playing that role in, am I saying this correctly? Totally. Just to bring everybody yeah. up to speed? Just embracing the idea that me being the one at home handling the lion's share of the things at home are of course consistent with my <laughs> negative belief that that's not good enough that that's not being supportive enough um, is it also with success like that's not enough yeah, in terms of your not, own career even though you yeah, founded a men's from, retreat well <laughs> <laughs> seriously you mean well you run soul degree you run the booster club for the high school you teach yoga classes you are a CFO and it's still not enough. And here's the thing that's so interesting, everybody. Hmm. I'm going to ask Chris a question he doesn't know I'm going to ask him. If you could go back and do something different these last three or four years and actually go and work and build, your own, build a business that's solely your own and not be around and, I mean, would you trade the years that you've had with our kids the last three years or for something else. No, definitely not. <laughs> well, see, then that's the thing that's crazy is here you're sitting here torturing yourself saying you're not good enough. You're not good enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. But given the option, if we could wave a magic wand and change everything and the circumstances would be different, but you had to trade the time that you had with our kids, would you do it? The answer is no. So here's the thing that's interesting, and I'm so happy that you admitted to that because it points out the fact that your default thinking isn't logical. It's just a habit. It's something you've been doing for so long that you don't even realize it. And even though it doesn't serve you, and even though, like Chris just said, he would never change a thing. And yet he still thinks it's not enough. That to me means that there is some automation here that's going on in your brain where it's set on default. Oh, I got to just think I'm not enough. I got to think I'm not enough. I got to think I'm not enough. You know? Well, here's the bigger question. If you allow this default mode to stay programmed in your brain, how is that going to impact your future? Particularly if you think about things like your aspirations for soul degree, the, you know, the men's retreat that you run. Hmm. It's, yeah, I think that if, if it perpetuates, then I'm, I'm obviously my own impediment to what I want it to be. You know, I, 
if I'm if I'm constantly in that mindset of it's not enough, I haven't done enough, then how could Soul Degree ever become what it should be? What do you want it to become? Uh, I think it, I would love to see it touch as many men's lives. You're about to cry, I could tell. <laughs> Yeah, as possible. Um, Why do you get choked up? Uh, just because I know the impact. I've experienced the positive impact that it can have. And I don't... It's, it's, it's limitless, I think, in the difference that it could make, regardless even of your age. So it's, do you see how your limiting belief, hmm. the default thinking that you're not enough will prevent you from, Oh, totally. How does it stop you when you think you're not enough? How does it stop you? Like, what are the things that, that you do when you start getting in that, that mindset? Well, it's probably things that you don't do, right? Cause you're not if you're not going to be good enough, well, why go do that thing? Whether it's write more or, um, you know, sort of test the elasticity of what soul degree could be also. I mean, it's in, it's, it's in a state uh, where there's still so much that we could do to enhance the experience, have it reach more people, which starts with my own Again, I think part of the limitation is that I've always argued, hey, I'm a shitty marketer. I don't, I'm not good at um, putting the word out, if you will. And even this conversation, <laughs> talking about something like Soul Degree is... How many of you can relate to this? It's, I, I could be a lot better at that. You're just stopping yourself, <laughs> not all the time because of your limiting belief. Like you go to write a blog post about the thing that fills your heart and you're like, ooh, should I really put this out there? Uh, that's your limiting belief. That's your default setting. And you're dead right, Chris, that and it's the same thing for me. And the same thing for Mandy. What was yours? Um, I'll never get there. I'll never get there. I love that one. I'll never get there. Yeah. Because you can feel like just the, the no matter how hard I try, it's never going to be enough. I'm never going to get there. It's never going to happen. And how that, that sets you up to just race and race and race and race. And Danielle, what's yours? I'm not smart enough. I'm not smart enough. Yeah, I'm not smart enough to do this. And so if your belief, the default that got programmed a long time ago is I'm not smart enough, then you'll tell yourself, I'm not smart enough to write this blog post. I'm not smart enough to figure this out. I'm not smart enough to build that kind of business. I'm not smart enough to attract the kind of person that I want. And the thing that's scary about default settings, everybody, is that not only are they automated in the default network in your brain, but they're a protection mechanism. By thinking you're not good enough, not smart enough, I'll never get there, I'm a, not a good person, you actually hold yourself back. And that's one of the reasons why we cling to it. And so if you haven't already, because we're going to wrap up this training and I'm going to tell you what's coming up tomorrow and then we're going to answer questions. Um, if you haven't already, you gotta please. you got to hear the quote, though, from Nepo today. Oh, okay. It's so on point. See, to this soul topic. degree right here. So every it's so morning, che- it's so cheesy, but no, it's, it's so not. Good. Every morning, Chris and I mostly sometimes. Um, uh, Chris reads from this. This is so tattered. He's been doing it for years. My mom also reads this book every single day. Your mom reads this book every single day. It's a page or two every single day. Mark Nero was rec- uh, was fighting cancer when he wrote this. And it's beautiful. So Nepo. There, Nepo. Mark Nepo? Did I say it wrong? <laughs> Nemo. I said Nemo. <laughs> but I'll Finding just, Nemo. I'll just read a snippet because it's so on point for January 3rd. That is okay. the 3rd, right? Today? Yeah. yeah. Each person is born with an unencumbered spot, free of expectation and regret, free of ambition and embarrassment, free of fear and worry, an umbilical spot of grace where we are each first touched by God. It is this spot of grace that issues peace. 
Psychologists call this spot the psyche. Theologians call it the soul. Jung calls it the seat of the un unconscious. Hindu masters call it the Atman. Buddhists call it Dharma. Rilke calls it inwardness. Sufis call it qualb. And Jesus calls it the center of our love. To know this spot of inwardness is to know who we are, not by surface markers of identity, not by where we work or what we wear or how we like to be addressed, but by feeling our place in relation to the infinite and by inhabiting it. This is the hard lifelong task for the nature of becoming is a constant filming over where we begin while the nature of being is a constant erosion of what is not essential. Oh. Each of us lives in the midst of this ongoing tension, growing tarnished or covered over, only to be worn back to that incorruptible spot of grace at our core. Well, I would say the one word that came to mind when you were reading that was, let's see if I can find it, not essential. Mm. You know, what's not essential is your default thinking and your negative belief. And in fact, it is essential that you get rid of it. You're awesome. You don't have to go. I'm going to, but I'm going to keep wrapping this. I am going to go. You are going? Where are you Bye. going? <laughs> I'm sure you He's have. got a blog post to write because now he's exactly. gotten rid of his, his uh, limiting belief. <laughs> Bye. Mm -hmm. See ya. Okay. Um, so tomorrow, so I want you to write your limiting belief in there. And, and here's another thing. What is it costing you right now? What are the things you're not doing because of that? limiting belief. For me, not being a good person, I think it's the thing that keeps me isolating myself. And it also, I can see how just like Chris was explaining that his limiting belief has him not doing things like writing more blog posts and putting himself out there. I, even though I'm out there, there's, I think a level to which I'm not because of this belief that I'm not a good person. Um, so I want you to write in the comments, what's your limiting belief and what's it costing you right now? What are you not doing because of it? And I want to come back to the opening quote. You have a choice. You're either going to repeat what you're doing or you're going to evolve it. And when you ask yourself these three questions, what is my limiting belief cost me in the past? What's it costing me right now? And what is it going to cost me if I continue to choose to do it? If I continue to choose to be on default, hopefully getting in touch with that will help you, give you, motivate you, push you to choose to be deliberate in what you're thinking next. Because tomorrow, tomorrow what we're going to be talking about is how do you create a deliberate belief, one that you don't believe yet. We're going to teach you how to think this, not that. Because it's essential that you have something to go to for when you catch yourself going to that default. So trust me when I tell you tomorrow we are going to take you from the, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I, need to, I need to stop doing this and into the mode of, okay, I got this. I can think this, not that. Now what I wanna do is I wanna talk to you about the three strategies that will keep you, the secrets to building an optimistic mindset. You ready? Excellent, here we go. Um, number one, the secret to an optimistic mindset. You gotta be maniacal about your intake. Negativity in here means negativity in your body gets stored here and negativity comes out here. It becomes this loop of negativity. And so in order to build a positive mindset, I want you to be maniacal about positive input. That means really watch your news intake. Do not be watching it every day get the facts, get what you need to know from a trusted, measured, calm, factual source, and then turn that shit off, okay? That's number one. Number two, edit your social media. Anything on your social media feeds should be helping you be more resilient, more optimistic, more um, positive, anything that you're following that triggers you, that is negative, that rubs you the wrong way. You know, one of the things that I've noticed, I have some favorite celebrities that I 
have um, followed for a while because I think they're funny or I love um, just kind of their sense of humor. But there are so many people that I have muted right now because I think that what they're doing online is so freaking out of whack. Seeing people give us advice about quarantining from the back of their estates and mansions, telling us to donate when they're not saying they're donating, seeing this kind of tone deaf uh, celebrity thing going on. I'm normally not a negative person about that, but I have muted, muted, muted so many accounts because it's not doing anything for me. And you got to be selfish right now. You have got to edit your social media feeds so that your social media feeds are helping you build an optimistic and positive mindset. And so every day, the second I see someone at mute, 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 unfollow, 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 because negativity in means negativity gets stored here, means negativity goes out there from you. You want to put positivity, optimism, tools, strategies, things that keep you laughing, keep things that keep you giving you things that you can use right now. The second you start getting overloaded with Corona stuff, mute that stuff, edit, edit, edit your social media based on what you need. That's number one, maniacal about your intake. The second secret to building an optimistic mindset is do tiny things every day that boost your mood, okay? So we're gonna build your mood muscle. If you can, move your body because negativity gets stored here and moving your body, we know based on the research, simply moving your body for 10 or 20 minutes a day will release chemicals in your mind that help you boost your mood. The second thing that will boost your mood is I want you to make a tiny promise to yourself every day. Just one thing that makes you feel more positive. Is it getting up on time? Is it eating something healthy? Is it only having one glass of wine or reaching for a mocktail? I want you to put one tiny promise into place. Put it into the um, comments right now. What's one tiny promise that you can make to yourself that you're going to do every day? It might just be that you're going to wake up every day, take a deep breath, remind yourself that you're healthy, and that's going to be the tiny promise. I want you to do one tiny promise every day because keeping a promise to yourself will boost your mood and make you feel more in control. Another way to build your mood muscle is have a zero tolerance policy for your own negative thoughts. Right now, as you edit social media and edit your news take and edit your negativity coming in from the outside world, do not tolerate negativity from the inside world. I woke up this morning, I looked in the mirror, I looked at the gray hairs that are coming in, particularly like right up here, and I started to go negative. I started to feel dreary and I went, Mel, cut this shit out. You gotta fight to stay positive, gal because we are in this for another couple months and do not succumb to despair. Do not start thinking negative stuff. When you have negativity internally, you gotta have a zero tolerance policy for that shit. It's one thing to feel what you need to feel so that you can move through it. It's another thing to let negativity dwell up here and start ruminating. Five, the five second rule is genius for this. Count fucking backwards. The second that negative, five, four, three, two, one. Not listening to it, no. I am redirecting my thoughts. That's right. I am looking for the things I can control. I am keeping a positive attitude by focusing on things that I can control right now today. Got it? Good. The third thing that you need to do in order to build a optimistic mindset. You ready, everybody? Here we go. I want you to pick a small 10-week goal that you can control. Why am I saying 10 weeks? I'm going to tell you why 10 weeks. Because I think that we've got 10 weeks ahead of us of physical distancing. I think we've got 10 weeks ahead of us, if we do it right, of life in this weird state. And I want you to pick one thing, one project, that's it. For the next 10 weeks, that's your personal project. It's something you can control. You ready? Something you can control. We're talking about how to build the skill of an optimistic mindset. And part of an optimistic mindset is focusing on what you can control. And I don't want you to jump ahead 
and worry about what's coming in the future. I want you to stay in this moment with me. I want you to realize that if you took on one small project for the next 10 weeks that you could control, something you've wanted to learn, some skill that you would love to have, some deficiency in your resume or your experience that you could gain in the next 10 weeks, there is something called YouTube University. That's right, Professor YouTube has so many tutorials out there, it's amazing. Right now, my husband is taking a Buddhist meditation teacher training class. My daughter is taking two classes. She is learning um, how to be better at Excel because she thinks it will help her with her summer internship. And it's something she was nervous about during the interview process. And she's also taking a painting class. What is one thing that if you were to use the next 10 weeks and we emerge from this and step into the next chapter of our lives and you have learned something or you have developed a skill that equips you to feel like you are better positioned to step into this next chapter, you will constantly wake up every day and say, today I get to take this class. Today I get to work on this thing. Today I get to spend an hour uh, polishing my Chinese, working on personal development. I see you, I see Hemi mom building a website. I see Sephora saying she's gonna improve her English. I see uh, Nabil saying I'm gonna develop editing and online skills. I see LDG creative healthy cooking. I see uh, Salio saying I'm gonna find a class on YouTube University. What's a 10 week thing? Oh, I see Jack saying I'm gonna take a French class. I'm gonna learn how to crochet. I'm going to begin an online master's program. If you narrow your span of control to managing your mood, to being maniacal about the intake into your mind and working on a 10 week goal, you will be building an optimistic mindset because you will have weeded out negativity in from the outside world, which means negativity won't get stored here and it won't get expressed from you. You will have built your mood muscle by forcing yourself to move every day, by keeping a tiny promise to yourself and by being absolutely zero tolerance for your own negative bullshit on the inside, five, four, three, two, one, redirect your mind to something you can control. And having a 10 week personal project where you pick something and you use YouTube University and you use this moment of time where you don't have anywhere to go and you don't have social distractions, you got time to focus on yourself these three things will help you build an optimistic mindset. Absolutely, positively guaranteed. Um, can I require this of my teenagers? Um, here's what I would say about teenagers. One of the hardest things for teenagers right now is their loss of independence. And um, trying to require anything of your teenagers other than showing up for family dinner and creating their own routine, I think is a recipe for disaster. What I would do instead is I would share that this is what you're doing. And I would ask your teenagers a question. If you had a half an hour, an hour every day where you dedicated it to something um, other than school or other than being on your phone looking at social media, what's one thing that you never have time to do that you love doing? Is it playing guitar? Is it painting? Is it journaling? Is it reading a book? Is it knitting? Is it uh, working on your uh, tricks out on the trampoline in the backyard? What is it? If you ask your teenagers questions, in answering the question, they may find the self-motivation that this is something they want to do. I love that that uh, I don't know how to say your name. Jowl is is working on emotional dependency and uh, breaking apart the patterns that had you become somebody that was codependent and emotionally dependent on other people. Um, Dr. Caro, I love you very much too. Uh, I think that's it uh, today. The whole broadcast was about optimism. The reason why you cannot allow yourself to get into this pessimistic mindset loop 
because it keeps you feeling helpless. It keeps you feeling stuck. It keeps you overwhelmed and it makes you just stay stuck here and why you got to build the skill of optimism. Because when you are optimistic, it's not that you're slapping a positive spin on a shitty situation. You are cultivating a mindset where you believe in your bones, your soul, every part of your being, that no matter what you're facing, you can have a positive impact on how you experience what you're facing because you can choose what you think about and you can choose how you respond. And when you start to develop an optimistic mindset, it creates more optimism. It helps you see solutions and opportunities. It makes you feel more in control. It gives you things that you can focus on. It begets the ability to feel empowered, which only creates more empowerment for you. And the three things that you can do to create an optimistic mindset is number one, here's the three secrets. Be maniacal about what you allow into your mind. Totally. We do not turn the news on in this house. We don't allow it. Because you know the old saying, if it leads, it bleeds. There's nothing but negativity coming off of the news right now. So there are a few things that we check. I look at the CDC, I look at the World Health Organization, and I look at the state of Massachusetts website, and that's about it. And I look at what Bill Gates is writing. And once I have the facts, I just focus on what I control, can control. I focus on my safety, that's it. I've also, every day I edit social media. Your social media should be serving you. If it triggers you in any way, if it creates any negativity, any ugh, uh, any tone deafness, any anything, mute it, unfollow, get rid of that shit. Social media should be a service that is supporting you right now in your efforts to stay positive, to stay empowered, to stay safe, and to stay laughing. That is what you should use it for right now. Uh, the second thing to do to build a positive mindset is build your mood muscle, move your ass, 10 to 20 minutes every day because your body stores negativity. Uh, make a tiny promise to yourself that you're going to keep every day because keeping a small promise builds confidence, makes you feel like you're in control and it creates momentum and zero tolerance for your own negative bullshit. You got it. It's one thing to feel feelings, to move through them. It's another thing to let negativity sit up here and make you ruminate five, four, three, two, one, in five seconds flat, you feel your own negativity, you get that bullshit out of there. You got no room for that stuff right now. And finally, the third thing you can do to start to build an optimistic mindset, establish a 10 week personal project. This is something that you are excited to do that you usually don't have time to do. Why 10 weeks? Because I think that 10 weeks is gonna see you through this moment of time. Uh, use YouTube University to watch tutorials. Take small step every single day. And remember this little hack that I taught you. Thank you, Lorenzo in Italy. If you start feeling the stress and anxiety and panic of, I need to do this, I have to do this. I can't get through my two list. I'm totally stressed out. Stop. Take a deep breath. Use these three words. I get to. I get to take an online class. I get to do my homework. I get to do this to-do list. I get to be home with my family. I get to have this time alone. I get to work on myself. I get to fight to be positive. I get to take 20 minutes every day and stream an exercise class. It will flip your mindset into one of optimism, of control, and gratitude. Because let's face it, if you're healthy right now, and if you're able to watch a video online, you have reason to be grateful. And when you remind yourself of that, you will feel positive. Um, somebody just asked me why Bill Gates. I'm going to answer real quick because he's one of the smartest human beings on the planet who has uh, made a commitment to donating almost his entire wealth to charities. And for the last decade, he and his wife have been at the forefront of uh, global health research and initiatives and taking action. And if there is a man who is informed, who has been studying this, he gave a TED talk in 2015 about pandemics, about world health, where he predicted this. He is talking about the fact that there are three things that we need to do right now. And one of them is we need uh, to all be uh, enforcing physical distancing for 10 weeks. We need to develop a way for everybody to test 
themselves so you know whether you've been exposed or not. And we need to collaborate globally on a vaccine. All three things based in facts and research, all three things that are measured and calm, all three things that make a hell of a lot of sense that I get behind. And so that's one of the reasons why. Research, credibility, a decade worth of experience, the smartest people on the planet, and a measured factual delivery. That is what I respond to, because I'll be damned if I allow fear, cynicism, uh, hysteria, any of that crap that you see all over the news and the internet right now to enter my mind. There is no reason for it. You have the facts. 10 weeks, keep yourself safe, keep your mind optimistic, stay connected with me, stay connected with your family and friends, and we will get through this a thousand percent. We will get through this together. Do it anyway is a mindset trick that you can use when you start to feel excuses rolling up. It works a lot like the five second rule. So you have said to yourself, okay, I'm going to talk to my boss today about that thing that I've been avoiding talking to them about. Or maybe you've said something like, I'm going to go to the gym today or tomorrow or whatever. And then the moment comes where you've got to have that conversation. Or the moment comes where it's time to pack up your bag and leave your desk and go to the gym. And what always happens? You don't feel like it. I bet there are plenty of you watching that have made a commitment that, nah, I'm not going to have a drink tonight. And then guess what happens when you get home? You don't feel like not drinking. You feel like having a drink. And so here's what do it anyway has done for me. The idea that I just do it anyway has pushed me to realize and to recognize that there are a lot of moments where there are things in my life that I really want to do, I need to do, I should do, but when the moment comes, I don't feel like it. And so I pull out this idea of, you know what, I'm just going to do it anyway. It's raining outside. I said I would go for a a short run. I don't feel like it. I'm going to do it anyway. It's six o'clock in the morning. I'm tired. It's cold. I laid out my yoga clothes, but now I don't feel like it. What do I do? I do it anyway. When you start to say to yourself, I'm going to do it anyway, what happens is something really cool. You acknowledge that there are feelings that you have that are trying to swoop in and hijack you. You acknowledge them and you basically say, guess what? I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Oakley is chomping at the bit that I, um, uh, that we asked this question. What is the question? All right. So is it on, is it on topic? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. It's from Ben S snack. Um, how can I make a huge life decision such as a job change? Move to another state. I want the job, but I'm scared. Oh, I love that. So the question is great question, Oakley and great question, Ben snack. (laughs) So how do you make a big decision, right? So it's a decision that sounds like he's going to accept a new job, but it requires him to move to another state. And notice what he said. I want it, but I'm afraid. This is the perfect question for right now because you would actually use do it anyway. You see, the thing about the way to make decisions, this is my decision-making tool. I don't think we haven't covered it yet in this, but for those of you that have followed me for a while, you know that I have this decision-making tool. In fact, we talked about it in the journaling method. So, you know, in the journaling method, if you go back to uh, videos 9, 10, and 11, and if you look at the journaling method that we um, talked to you about, and look, I want to tell you something. I'm not, ex- I'm not asking you to buy this. In fact, please don't buy the five-second journal. We don't have any more in stock. They're sold out around the globe. We'll print more. I'm, do not buy this. I'm not doing this uh, training to ask you to buy anything. I'm showing you this because for those of you that don't have the journaling method in front of you, if you go to uh, 5secondjournal.com, 5secondjournal.com, if you go to 5secondjournal.com, what you will find is a ton of free templates that will show you the journaling method for free. You don't ever have to buy that. I'm telling you not to buy it. I want to be very clear. The reason why we're doing these trainings is not to get you to buy something, okay? It's to help you learn how to reset your mind. So back to the question. The opening thing in the journal... Do I have one that's open here? Because then I can hold, well, I'll just open this one. The opening thing in the journal is a fuel gauge that has you tune in, and this is going to get to decision making, that has you tune in 
to how you are feeling energy wise every morning. And so let me show you what that looks like in case you haven't seen those videos yet. So you see this little fuel gauge right here. Oh, can you see it on Instagram? Oak? Am I holding it up? Yeah. Just oh. like not that one. Yeah, there you go. You okay. Really there well. you go. So that fuel gauge is uh, a visual cue to have you tune into your energy and to assess whether or not you are depleted and empty about something and heavy or the other um, extreme is energized, full, um, expanded, uh, open to possibility. And the reason why I ask you to do that first thing in the morning to assess your mood, to assess your energy, to tune in is because there's established research that says that your mood in your morning impacts your productivity and focus all day long. And so if you can boost your mood in the morning, it has a material impact on your focus and on your uh, productivity all day. And so we use it in the morning in the journaling method that I've taught you in videos nine through 11. But when it comes to, deci to decisions, I want you to do the exact same thing. I get that you're scared. It's a change. I would be kind of surprised if you weren't a little nervous about doing something awesome, like moving to a new state and uh, starting a, a new job and all the possibilities that come in with it. So if you're trying to make a decision, do I do this thing that's scary or not? What you do is tune inward and really assess how do you feel about it? When you think about yourself living in this new place and having this new job and all the possibility and growth that comes with it, do you feel dead and depleted and stuck? Or do you feel energized? and alive and full of possibility. You see, if the decision is something that will expand your future, that will create possibility, that will make you um, grow, then it is a thousand percent something that you must do. And you must do it even though you're afraid. And the fear is a very normal thing. And the fear is there because you're about to do something new. But do not use the fear to talk yourself out of making a decision that actually is grounded in growth and possibility and energizing you. So that's how I make decisions using the stuff that you're learning in the Mindset Reset. And again, you can go back to the journaling method on videos 9, 10, and 11. But if you have a big decision to make and you notice that you're afraid or you notice that you're stuck up here, go in. Go in and ask yourself, does the decision deplete me, make me stuck, make me feel dead, make me feel heavy? Or does the decision, even though it scares me, even though it's hard, is there something about it that expands possibility and opens up my life and, and will give me an opportunity to grow? If you're in this camp, the answer is heck yes. If you're in the dead camp and the duh, hell no, heck no, okay? All right, cool. Um, let me give you a shout out real quick. Because the do it anyway thing, I do it every morning. Because here's the deal about me, you guys. I hate exercising. I hate it. Yeah, you do. I, yeah, I do. I hate it. But I, actually, I should say it this way. I hate going. I hate getting dressed for it. I hate driving there. But I love how I feel when I've done it. I love it. And so do it anyway has helped me get through the front resistance the part that I hate. And it helps me get there. And once I'm there, I absolutely don't necessarily love the exercise, but when I'm done, I love how I feel. And so that's how I use do it anyway. Okay. Every day I use do it anyway, because it works so powerfully for me to push my excuses aside and to actually take care of my body, which is a very important thing in terms of my commitment, in terms of my desire to really enjoy my life fully. But I never, ever, ever, I'm never the kind of person that wakes up and goes, yeah, let's go exercise. I'm never the kind of person that is driving there going, I'm so excited to do this. I'm never the kind of person walking in that's even like, yes, I'm so glad I made it. I dread it usually all the way through it. Um, sometimes I half enjoy it while I'm there, but mostly I dread it. 
But by the time it's over, I frigging love the fact that I went. And that's why I do it. So first of all, motivation is complete garbage. Everybody's sitting around waiting to feel like it, Jay. And this is a recipe for never seeing your dreams come true yeah. and dying with a lot of regret. Thank you very much. Welcome to my TED Talk. This has been very inspiring. No, I, seriously, like I want you to understand that you will never feel ready to do things that scare you. You will never feel ready to jump off the cliff. You will never feel ready to take that leap. And the reason why is based on science and research. Your brain is designed to protect you and change requires risk. And so you are protecting yourself by saying maybe tomorrow. This is where the five second rule comes in super handy. So if you are constantly procrastinating, you probably have a bias towards thinking and you can use the five second rule to literally push yourself to take action. All you're gonna do is count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. That's it. I know it's as dumb as the high five. It's as simple as the high five. It has profound research behind it because what you're doing when you start counting backwards and you have to count backwards, it does not work if you count up. It doesn't work because counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, requires you to focus. When you focus, you flip the switch and your prefrontal cortex turns on. This is a starting ritual that interrupts the patterns of overthinking, of fear, of anxiety, of procrastination, of comparison that are making you go, ah, tomorrow, not today, I don't feel like it. Five, four, three, two, one, your prefrontal cortex turns on. That's the part of the brain you need to either learn new behavior or take action that's inspired. So now when you get to one, you got a shot mm -hmm. at doing something different, so move. And here's the real secret to this. The second you started counting, you actually made a decision to change. So the counting is the Trojan horse to the bigger thing you're avoiding. Five, four, three, two, one launches you through the resistance and it pushes you into action. That's the only way you're gonna change. Sitting there listening to us, lightning is not gonna strike you on the couch. Jay and I are not gonna show up and kick you or drag you out of your house and make you go on that run. If you wanna change your life, you must make a decision to change your life. And, you know, I'm going to say something that I really hope happens from you listening to Jay and I today. I think it's very easy to sit in this moment in your life and to look back at your life and to see how everything that's ever happened to you, positive and negative, is a dot on the map of your life that has led you here. True power is knowing that this moment right here is also a dot on your map and that this moment, too, is connecting you forward on the map of your life towards something extraordinary that hasn't happened yet. And you can either sit here and listen to this and let this dot come and go, or you can wake the heck up and realize at some point the map takes you to a final destination and we don't know when that is. But if you want to change your life, you got to make a decision to change your life. And sitting around and waiting to feel ready is not the decision I want you to make. So when you're done listening to this, five, four, three, two, one. I want you to turn toward that thing that you've always dreamt of, that you've been waiting to do, and you go and you move toward the thing that is meant for you because that's the only way you're going to get there. Thank you for having me. And you, I think of probably anybody on the planet will get what I'm about to say in your bones because yeah. you understand the profound impact that the five second rule is a starting ritual has has had on millions of people's lives, helping them move from thinking yeah. to doing. And even sitting here, Jim, with you, which it's just an honor being such a fan of your work too, uh, to be here with you, even sitting here knowing the impact that the five second rule has had on millions of people's lives. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. What's that? The high five habit is an even bigger deal with more profound change. And I uh, can't wait to unpack it, but I'll tell you personally, I use the five second rule to turn my life around, mm -hmm. to go from being bankrupt to being extraordinarily successful, to changing every habit I have, to improving my marriage. It got me into action. But I'll tell you what it never did. It never silenced the critic in my head that I lived with. It never ended the relentless beatdown that I was giving myself. And it never broke the habit that I had of constantly hating myself or focusing on the things that weren't working instead of celebrating myself and focusing on the things that were. 
and the high five habit cuts right down through all that noise and reconnects you with the you that's in there, with the confidence that is your birthright and the way that it literally reprograms your mind is breathtaking. Well, you know, I we talk a lot about morning routines and this was the the easiest thing to add to my morning routine that's given me so much in, in return. And uh, not, not just in terms of in, the, in a short period of time, you know, in terms of the ripple of it, but even just immediately, I, you know, just celebrating my, myself um, in, the, in the bathroom mirror. And what we could, we could talk about how that, that works. I'm also, by the way, pulling back a big fan of just counting down from five, you know, what, getting myself out of bed or getting myself to put on my, my running shoes. And so I could see, I could see the difference um, in how they complement each other so well. And so maybe we could walk our listeners through this. And I would highly recommend everyone. I mean, our audience loves to read to make sure you get your copy also as well. Well, so it's very simple. And since I know that your listeners want to get right into the science and right into what to do, I'm not even going to tell you the story because I did not set out to create this. I created the high five habit on a morning that everybody can relate to a morning where life felt overwhelming a morning where I felt defeated, a morning where I felt sort of stuck and dreading the day. And I was standing there brushing my teeth, Jim, and I catch my reflection in the mirror. And I think, oh, you look like hell. And then all of a sudden I started to criticize the way that I looked, like the dark circles under my eyes, the the bags under my like kind of chin and neck and one boobs hanging lower than the other. And then once your thoughts go negative, they kind of take you down. So now I'm thinking about my day ahead and I'm beating myself up. Why'd I get up so late? And I've only got eight minutes to the first mm-hmm. Zoom call and the dog hasn't even been walked. And you just said something interesting. It's an easy thing. The high five habit is an easy thing to add to the morning routine. We all talk a lot about morning routines. It wasn't until I discovered this that I realized there was a piece to my morning routine I was not even aware of, a habit that I needed to break, Jim, Mm. a habit that gratitude and exercise and all this stuff was not actually erasing, a habit of standing before the bathroom mirror and either ignoring the human being you see in the mirror or Mm. criticizing them. That is how we start our day. 91% of women don't like how they look. 50% of us can't even look in the mirror. I know it's true for men too. We stand in judgment. And so what happened for me this morning, here's the high five habit. It is profoundly simple. It's going to change your life. The second you're done brushing your teeth, and I want you to do it right after you brush your teeth, because I want you to stack this habit with something you're already doing. Cause you know, cause you listen to this podcast that, It's the fastest way to learn a new behavior. Let's get the gunk out of your teeth so you don't spread dragon breath on everybody. Now let's get the gunk out of your head so you're not spreading negativity throughout your day. As you stand in front of the mirror, I want you to leverage a little piece of research from Harvard. New research shows that if you take less than a minute and you intentionally think about the day ahead and how you're going to show up as a leader, it changes your productivity, your focus, how you show up and your ability to impact people. Let's throw that out the window in terms of being a leader and let's look in the mirror and let's use that for ourselves to improve our own lives. I want you to take a second and I want you to realize there's actually two people in the bathroom every morning, Jim. There's you and there's a human being in the mirror that's been waiting for you Mm. to wake up and realize they need you. They're trying hard. They've got a good heart. They need your support and your encouragement. They need you to see them. They need you to love them. That is literally what I'm talking about when I talk about the high five habit, that you wake up and recognize there is a person you go through life with that stares you back in the mirror every morning, and your habit right now is to tear them down or ignore them. And I want you to set an intention and I want you to look at them in the morning. And this is going to feel weird because you're going to realize I've never actually asked myself this question. And here's the question. What is that person in the mirror? What is she or he or they? What do they need from me 
today. Mm -hmm. We think about it for work, for our families, for everybody else. You've never stopped and asked yourself, looking at yourself in the mirror, how do I need to show up for that person today? Then as you've got that intention, despite the fact that it feels weird, despite the fact that you're going to resist this, and we can talk about why you're going to feel most likely resistance. I then want you to raise your hand and I want you to high five the reflection. And what's amazing about this new habit, Jim, is your brain and your nervous system are already designed to do the work for you. Mm Mm-hmm. Because also, you I mean, you think about how we high five other people, you know, throughout the day yep. you know, and to celebrate them, to, to encourage them, but we're not always doing that. I mean, it's interesting because no, no amount of love is enough to fill the yearning of our, that our soul requires um, from ourselves, right? You know, some, when do we work daily uh, on being in love with that person in the mirror who has been through so much, but is, but is still standing? Yeah. And think about some of the habits that we know based on research, change your life. Meditation. Meditation is profoundly important. The benefits you talk about all the time, meditation develops self-awareness. It Mm -hmm. also helps you learn how to be non-reactive to your thoughts, but it doesn't change your default thoughts. Gratitude, also hugely important, tremendous benefit. Yes, you should have a gratitude practice. However, Almost all of us, when we practice gratitude, we think about things outside of ourselves that we're grateful for. And so the high five habit is about bringing the power back in house. It's about giving you a science back tool that will teach you through a simple action, how to support, how to love, how to encourage, how to celebrate yourself every single day. And let me explain the science because this is where things get crazy. The reason why this works is because of the programming that's already in your brain. So you have a lifetime of giving and receiving high fives. In fact, Jim, when somebody high fives you or you high five somebody else, what is the gesture alone of a high five? Tell somebody else that they, they are extraordinary. They are amazing. Congratulations. You, you, you know, you're, you're, you're winning, you know, exactly. Exactly. You don't ever high five somebody and say, I hate you. You always <laughs> high five and you're like, I love you. We got this. No problem. You're, you know, go get them. You're going to win. Even if somebody just blew it, you high yeah. five them. And it's like, shake it off. Come on. I still yeah. believe in you. Let's go. And so all of that programming is right here in the interior of your brain. It's in your basal ganglia. It is in your subconscious. It is sitting there and it is married to the action of high-fiving. So what happens is when you stand there, you set this intention, you're with yourself, you see yourself, you feel the resistance, you ignore the resistance, you go to high-five yourself. Your brain's like, oh, I know what this gesture means. It activates the subconscious programming. It silences the critic and the beatdown. You can't think anything but positive thoughts. It's impossible neurologically because of the programming already in your brain. And then over time, if you do this, give me just five days, you do this five days in a row, fight through the weirdness because it's new and the resistance because you have the opposite habit, you judge yourself, you reject yourself. When you high five yourself, it silences that, it activates the programming that's already in your brain and it starts to marry it with your own reflection. And that's not all. I talked to our buddy, Dr. Amen, the other day. He went bananas when he heard about this. He's like, (laughs) Mel, holy cow. Do you realize you also get a boost in your mood? Because when you high five other people, you get a dopamine drip. So you get a dopamine drip when you do this to yourself. He also said, you know how when you come into the bathroom and you're kind of dragging in the energy and when you high five yourself, whether it's because you laugh or because you just kind of feel good, you get this little like pep in your step. So you start your day feeling slightly more energized. I'm like, yeah, Dr. Amon, tell me about that. He said, well, that's your nervous system. Your nervous system is encoded with celebratory energy. When you cross the finish line, you raise your hands. When yeah. your favorite team scores, you raise your hands. When you say hello to somebody, you raise your hands. When you hug somebody, you raise your hands. When you high five, you raise your hands. Your nervous system remembers it. That's where the energy comes from. The coolest thing about the high five habit, Jim, 
is the programming is already in you because you've been doing this your whole life for everybody else. Yeah. And when we are hardwired for this. Hardwired. In fact, when you were born, DNA, in your DNA was celebration and joy. Little kids, when you see them in front of a mirror, they don't step back and go, my thighs are fat, man, I'm a loser. They don't do that. They spin, they high five the mirror, they kiss the mirror, they love themselves. This is your birthright. It was your life experience that taught you to judge and reject yourself. And I'm here to tell you this simple habit of standing before the mirror and raising your hand and high-fiving yourself like you so willingly do for everybody else. Yeah. You don't have to say a thing. You can have resistance. You can feel that it's weird. You can literally reject it in your mind as you start to do it, and you will, you will experience massive transformation as you complete the gesture because your mind is wired for this. You know, my husband, Jim, a lot of people know the story because it was his restaurant business failing that rocketed us into this personal crisis. And that's when I invented the five second rule. Well, his best friend and he worked at that restaurant business for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, they sold it for a song to a new investor. And it, our best friend, his business partner, was able to shrug and go, OK, well, that's entrepreneurship. I'm very proud of what we did. Uh, I'm proud of how hard we worked. And, you know, did we return the profit we wanted? No, but I'm still proud of myself. My husband couldn't do that. My husband said, I failed. Mm -hmm. Do you know, for seven years, he has looked in the mirror every morning, Jim, like so many of us do, and dragged his past in there and said, because this thing in my past, I am a failure. I am unworthy. Mm -hmm. I am unlovable. When I first started this high five thing in April of 2020 to pick myself up after getting fired from my dream job as a talk show host and in the throes of the pandemic and my kids in crisis and the world in crisis and just feeling overwhelmed, Chris couldn't do it. And the reason why he couldn't do it is the reason why everybody's resistant to doing it. It's because he was dragging all of that judgment and everything from his past into the bathroom every morning. Mm. And he was saying, because of that experience, I don't see a human being that's worthy of celebration. So if you've experienced trauma or abuse or discrimination, or you've been abandoned, or you know, you're a human being and you've done things you've regretted, or you wish you could change, and you'd forgive Jim or me for it, but you stand in judgment of yourself, you will resist this. Because right now you see a human being who doesn't deserve celebration. If you're like Jim and I, and you are very much achievement driven, you may realize as you resist this, that you don't celebrate yourself unless you've done something, unless you've worked out, oh. unless you've got yeah. the money in the bank, unless you're driving the Range Rover, unless you fix that thing. And what I'm here to tell you is we got it all opposite, Jim. Yeah. You see, we've been withholding the very support and celebration that we need in order to feel inspired, encouraged, and motivated to right. take the actions that change our life. So let's talk a little bit about confidence, okay? First of all, I've already said it's a skill. It doesn't matter if you were born the most insecure, thumb-sucking, abused, pathetic soul of a human being. You can build the skill of confidence. It doesn't matter if you came out of the womb, super ego driven and larger than life and confident and all that stuff. You still have a lot of work to do when it comes to confidence, authentic confidence. So let me talk to you about what is the skill of confidence. Okay, you ready? My definition of confidence is not belief in self. What you're gonna learn about Mel Robbins is that I love evidence-based advice because I'm kind of skeptical. You know, I was trained as a lawyer. Life has kicked me up, kicked me around a little bit. I kind of cross my eyes at people that are very kind of motivational. And, you know, I'm like, well, it's easy to do the inspirational stuff, but what's the depth, right? What's the depth? And so when I think about confidence and my definition of confidence, 
I looked at the research on confidence, okay? And there's really good news here. The first thing you've already learned, it's a skill. The second thing that you are gonna learn that's really good is it's, it's very simple to build the skill of confidence. And you can do it through repetitive actions every day, very simple little things that will slowly build up the reservoir of confidence. And here's the definition I wanna give you of confidence. Confidence is the willingness to try. That's it. I'm going to say it again. Confidence is the willingness to try. That's it. That's all that it is. And the reason why I like this definition is because this definition that I have created for confidence, which is the willingness to try, is based in the research around confidence. So if you want to learn more about this, Google confidence competency loop, okay? I'm going to show it to you. I'm hoping that, that this is not broadcasting backwards, okay? This is my fancy little graphic, okay? This is what we call a confidence competency loop. I did not invent this. This is something that people who research confidence for a living have created. And I've highlighted this because this is where confidence begins. It begins with the willingness to try, because I'm going to show you what ends up happening if you're the kind of person who trains yourself. Notice the words I'm using, trains. We're not going to sit around and wait for motivation. We're not going to wait for courage. We're going to manufacture those things. And this is where the five second rule is so transformative. Now, for those of you that don't know it, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time explaining it. I'm gonna give, it, give you the shortcut. It's just a simple brain hack backed by tremendous evidence that I created at the worst moment of my life that turns out to have extraordinary science behind it. All you do is in a moment where you feel doubt, insecurity, fear, anxiety, procrastination, perfectionism, PTSD, OCD, anything that you might possibly have that would rise up to block you, you simply count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, okay? And you gotta count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. And what that will do is it will shift gears in your mind. Instead of being stuck here in the part of the brain that keeps you stuck worrying and thinking and having a bias towards overthinking and being a perfectionist, you're gonna go one, four, or five, four, three, two, one, and you're gonna try. Now, this is what's gonna happen. The first time you try, you will fail. That's really good news. You want to know why? You learn by failing. You learn by failing. Do you realize that's how you've always learned? That when you were a kid, you don't remember this, but when you were learning to walk, you fell an average of 17 times an hour. You actually learn to walk by falling. And so you learn everything when you fail. Because when you fail, as much as you may think you're gonna die, if you stand on a stage, I see a lot of you who wanna be coaches or speakers or whatever, you're gonna have to learn how to give a speech where you stutter and where your, your mouth gets really dry and pasty and where you get a neck rash and where you forget what you're supposed to say. You gotta do all that stuff, why? Because when you fail, you don't die you actually gain knowledge and experience. And that's the gift of failure because you then take that knowledge and that experience and you go right back to the next time. And then you try again. But this time when you five, four, three, two, one, try, you're gonna take your knowledge and experience with you and you're gonna fail a little bit less. And what you're gonna learn there, you're gonna take right back to the next time that you try. And every time that you fail, you're gaining knowledge and experience. And you take that to the next time that you try. And you're going to go like this. And you're going to go like this. And you're going to keep going and going and going and going and going. And every time you five, four, three, two, one, you push yourself to try. You gain a little bit of competency for the next time you're going to do it. And every time you gain a little bit of competency, your mastery goes up. And that's when you start to feel more self-assured. And that 
muscle everybody of trying. That is where you build the skill of confidence, which is the willingness to not be so damn serious and hung up on being perfect and being worried about looking stupid. And instead you're willing to lean in and try something. And what ends up happening, because so many people have a definition around confidence, it's about belief in self or self-awareness and all this kind of stuff. And that's great, but I don't prefer those definitions because then you're sitting around waiting to feel ready. You're sitting around and in those moments where you don't believe in yourself, you feel like you don't have a reservoir of confidence to draw on. And it couldn't be further from the truth. You were born with natural intelligence and confidence. How do I know that? I know it because it's part of the design of a human being. Think about what you were like as a child before the world got their hands on you. You just let whatever you were interested in pull you forward. You would crawl towards or tumble toward anything that you were interested in, you'd try anything. You'd crawl up to a mirror and stick your hands on it and lick the thing you loved yourself so much. But life got its meaty hands on you and started telling you no. Do you know the average kid hears some version of the word no, some redirection almost 400 times a day. So you became cautious. You started holding yourself back. You started thinking before you tried things. You started worrying about feelings. This is where it all begins. But you were born knowing how to do this. And the other reason why I know this is true is because you wouldn't know what it felt like. You wouldn't miss it if you hadn't once felt it. You wouldn't know any different. So I want you to know it's in you. And we got to just remove the block that life put in place and teach you that even in those moments where you doubt yourself, even in those moments where you're afraid, even in those moments where you're insecure, you can try. And it's in the skill of trying that you gain the competency, the knowledge, and the expertise that helps you become better and better and better. Because here's the trick. You know, the more experienced you become in something and the more you master it, the less stressed out and anxious and worried you are about doing it. That's how that sort of belief in self comes. The belief doesn't come first. It's a byproduct of you pushing yourself to try. So let me unpack some other things that I wanted to talk about quickly before we get into the Q&A. I promised to talk about self-doubt. And I wanna, I wanna talk about the difference between self-doubt, which is one block, and people-pleasing. Um, you know, I should probably share with you sort of this whole story about um, the way that I think about blocks, okay? So, uh, you know, again, I'm working on this book about this. And the other day, um, this was this fall, I went out to Los Angeles to move my daughter into her off-campus apartment. And she's got this huge kind of laundry room in the basement. You know, have you ever been in a, a laundry room, like in a commercial space where they've got all the lines of dryers? And so I was washing her sheets like, you know, moms and dads do when they move their kids into their off-campus apartments. And it was the final load of the day. I go downstairs to the basement and I open up the dryer and I'm like, that's funny. The sheets aren't dry yet. And so I put in a bunch more quarters. I hit the button. I leave. I go out the door and I hear, eh, and I'm like, that can't be my dryer. What? So I go back and the 30 minutes is still on the dryer. And I'm like, that's weird. So I open it up. They're damp. And it smells kind of like hot metal. And uh, I see the filter and I think, oh, I wonder if the filter's jammed. You know how like a dryer doesn't really work when the filter is filled? So I like try to open it and this sucker is really jammed. So luckily two guys walk in with a basket of laundry and I get one of them to like help me. And it's so jammed, he has to put his like foot up on the thing and like yank it out. And when he yanks it out, like, like literally it was like a lint carnival. I don't think any one of the kids that live in that building had ever pulled that freaking filter out of that dryer. There was a disgusting disgusting stack of lint 
like this freaking big, you guys. It was like gray and blue and black and red. And like, it was like artifacts. I, it was like an archeologist of laundry land. I'm like, ah, oh, it's disgusting. So I like pull that thing off. And then the janitor walks in. He's like, ah, these damn kids. And this is gonna start a fire. And so we clean it off and he puts the filter back in and he turns to me and he says, um, you know, Lent builds up, it's little, but it builds up and it blocks the flow of air. And, you know, it, it gets so hot in that dryer, the whole place could burn down. I seen it happen. And then he goes, but now that it's clear, the dryer can do what it's designed to do. And it gave me the biggest aha, and this is what I'm writing this book about. There is a filter in your mind called the RAS. It's called the reticular activity system. I like to call it the red Acura spotter because the way that this filter works, think about it, it's like a giant hairnet on your head, okay? The way that this filter works is that it blocks out things that it thinks is not important to you. And it only lets in like 1% of what's going on in the world. And here's the interesting thing. It can be programmed. It's very nimble. If you've ever gone out to buy a car, have you ever noticed that all of a sudden you go into the dealership, you're like, oh, I like that red Acura. And then the next day, what do you see everywhere? You see red Acuras because your RAS, the hairnet on your brain, the filter that, that, that influences absolutely everything that you think and do. By you going to shop for a car, it has gone, oh, ding, 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 hold on. Mel Robbins is interested in red Acuras. Let them in, let the red Acuras in. And all of a sudden, every red Acura is now getting in through the hairnet in your brain, okay? So this is good news because if you decide that that dream that is meant for you is something that you want, you can program that sucker to let in information that is related to it. And suddenly it becomes so easy to spot opportunities and easy to gain momentum and easy to try. Here's the problem, you ready? Your freaking filter is trapped with mental lint. That's right. You wanna know what lint stands for? Because I'm a freaking genius. Lint stands for those moments when you lose inspiration due to negative thoughts. Thank you, everybody. I know, I'm a genius. You can read all about it this fall. So you've got a filter that could help you make everything happen, but you wanna know what? You've got this layer of crap in your brain, just like that dryer vent had a layer of lint in it because nobody had changed the filter. You cannot do a load of laundry, people, without creating lint. And you cannot go through a day in your life without having some sort of negative mental lint build up. You have a lifetime of lint that is clogging the filter in your brain. I know it. I can teach you how to remove it. And it's impacting your willingness to try. And the two forms of Lent, there are five of them, but I'm going to talk about two of them right now. The first one is doubt. And doubt is the kind of moment when you lose inspiration due to the negative thought, it'll never happen for me. You want to know why Mel Robbins has never done a live event, ever. I've never done any kind of live event on my own. You wanna know why? Because I've got negative crap built up from childhood that makes me say, no one will show up. True story. Tell me if you've been to an event in a stadium that I have produced. You haven't, right? Because I too have lint in there. And here's the great thing, just like that dryer, when you realize you have a filter that needs to be checked, and you've got a filter in your mind that needs to be cleaned every day, once you spot the lint, it's easy to go, oh my God, look at that bullshit, get that out of here. Come on, Mel, please. Once you clear away the doubt, it will never happen for me. You can go, oh, look at that stupid lint. There it is again, it'll never happen for me. I don't think so, wipe that stuff away. Now you can use the definition of confidence. I'm willing to try. Whether it happens or not is irrelevant. I gotta be willing to try.
In this video, I'm gonna show you the specific way that you can use the five second rule to increase your productivity. Now first, let's talk a little bit about productivity as a concept. Productivity is not about blasting through your to-do list and doing more, it's actually about doing less. Productivity is the ability to make progress on the things that matter to you. It sounds simple, right? I mean, just move the ball down the field on the important stuff. But it's not easy. Why? Blame your feelings. You see, you're capable of being more productive. You're just waiting to feel like doing what you need to do. And guess what? You're never going to crack the whip on yourself when you have a million other things that you need to do and you got people that are making demands on you. One thing that you must understand is that you have the power to decide what's important. And productivity actually boils down to simple five second decisions. Here's one that you need to start making immediately that will have a tremendous impact on your ability to be productive. When the alarm goes off, do you wake up early to work on your business or do you blow it off because you don't feel like it, you're tired? Or do you stick to the plan to finish some important tasks or do you mainline Facebook instead because ah, you'd just rather relax? When you change your decisions, you'll change everything because productivity boils down to the ability to make small five second decisions that put the things that are important first. And here's one five second decision that will make you more productive than any other. Get up 30 minutes earlier than you normally do and push yourself to work on the most important priorities first. This isn't just me. Research shows that your most productive hours are the first two to three hours after you wake up and get ready. This means that for peak productivity, you've got to do whatever you can do to make sure the most important work to you gets done first during that window of time. So here's how you're going to use the rule. The moment your alarm goes off and you want to hit the snooze button, use the rule. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, push yourself out of bed. Then use the rule again, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Sit down and get working on the things that matter to you instead of checking your phone, instead of letting your day get hijacked. You see, the moment you feel yourself wanting to give in to distraction, you're gonna use the rule again, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, to assert control and get back on task to the things that matter to you. It doesn't really matter how busy you are, we're all busy. If you really care, you'll find the time. And that's how you're gonna use the rule, to find the time to work on things that matter to you. This is what Rachel did. She wanted to change her life, so she decided to make progress on what was important. And she did this by starting with getting up earlier, getting out of bed, and five, four, three, two, one, focusing on what mattered. And as you can see, that small five second decision, getting up 30 minutes earlier, started a chain of events that changed her entire life. She lost 30 pounds, she bought her first home, and she reinvigorated her marriage. Why? The reason why is because she learned how to beat the feelings and excuses that stopped her, and she found the time to work on things that matter. That is the definition of productivity. Getting the important stuff done only works when you push yourself to do it. And when you push yourself, five second decision, to wake up earlier and start your day off right, you will be shocked by what changes it ignites. This is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to productivity. There are tons of strategies that I discuss that are based in research in chapter 10 of the five second rule book and how you can use all of this research in combination with the five second rule to not only become more productive, but to end procrastinating forever, to regain your focus whenever you get distracted, and lots of other things that are gonna help you improve your quality of work and also your life. The book is available on Amazon, barnesandnoble.com and at your local bookstore. One of the things that I learned in researching the book, The High Five Habit, which was freaking news to me, Chase, but once you have somebody unpack it, you're like, oh shit. Well, that <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Um, it is research from a woman who was at UCLA for a long time, one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. She studies the brain and what it takes for the brain to learn, to change, to create. And one of the things that she discovered is the connection between your nervous system and your brain's ability to function as it's designed. And to just really dumb it down, mostly for myself, um, 
this is how I've boiled down what she talks about. So your nervous system trumps your brain. And when you are in a state of stress or anxiety or uncertainty and your nervous system gets locked into a fight or flight response, which is what everybody is in, there's no way, I mean, your wife may not be there because she is a expert in meditation, she's a practitioner, so she has uh, daily practices that help her flip off what's called the sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight, anxiety on edge. Oh fuck. How am I paying the bills? What's happening in politics? Gas prices are now crazy. When are we getting off zoom? Are the kids going back to school? Do I have to wear a mask? Do I need a booster? Like all of that shit that you're processing that makes your nervous system fire up like alarm, alarm, alarm. That's your sympathetic nervous system. If you don't switch that sucker off and flip on the other nervous system, you got two nervous systems, sympathetic, parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is your resting nervous system. It's your grounded, calm. It's the nervous system that's in play when you're in flow, being creative. It's what it feels like when you're grounded in your body and you're okay and you feel okay. And so what I learned from Dr. Judith Willis is that when your sympathetic fight or flight, oh fuck nervous system is running the show, your brain doesn't work properly because the alarm system takes over. And I can explain this using a very simple example. If all of a sudden the alarms went off in the studio that you're in and you smelled smoke, would you be able to solve a math problem? No. No. <laughs> of course I'm not. out. I'm out. out. Well, that's basically what it's been like for the last two years. The fire alarms are going off and your body, your nose smells smoke. And so your nervous system flips on an alarm. The reason why it's so hard to focus. The reason why you're exhausted by one o'clock in the afternoon, the reason why you feel like you're one more thing away from checking yourself in and needing help is because your nervous system is just fried and it's impacting your ability to think clearly. And so there's a simple trick that you can use. And I know you've talked about the vagus nerve a lot on your show. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a really important thing to understand. It's a treasure inside your body. The vagus nerve is a nerve that runs all the way from, you know, your seat through every major organ, your vocal cords, all the way up to the top of your head. And the vagus nerve is the on off switch between your, oh shit, nervous system and your, I got this nervous system. And so a simple thing that you can do and I want everybody to do this at the beginning of their day. And the reason why I want you to do it at the beginning of your day is because I guarantee you, particularly because you're in business for yourself, you're waking up on edge. Your cortisol levels, the stress hormone are the highest first thing in the morning. And so when you wake up and you're already at, on edge feeling like, oh my God, how am I going to get through the day? How am I going to pay my bills? You're rattled, you're thinking, you're worried, your cortisol levels are high. That means your, oh shit, nervous system, your alarm system is already ringing. So we got to flip the switch and turn off the alarm before you start your day so that your brain can focus and work for you. So the way you're going to do this, I call this high-fiving your heart. We're going to press in the center of your body and that's going to kind of right by your heart, it's going to press on your vagus nerve. That's where the on off switch is. And I'm going to teach you to manually flip the switch and to turn off the alarm system and to turn on the calm, grounded, creative nervous system that's going to help you get back into a state of flow and help you be more strategic because right now is the most extraordinary moment in time for you as a business owner, I believe, and for a creator. So as you're pressing right here, you're just going to take a deep breath go ahead. And now I want you to say these three sentences. 
I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm loved. I'm loved. That's it. And most mornings, I need to do it about 23 times. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, what I know, happens- but I just, I love that about you, though. Like, you're like, 23 times. <laughs> like, no, that, like... <laughs> Well, you you know when it's I know. when you can stop because you actually have a sensation of the yeah, rattle settling, yeah. and yeah. you come back into your body. And I didn't realize until I learned how to turn off the alarm and turn on that cool rested state that my default for as long as I can remember, Chase has been alarm mode, that I have been running so fast, mostly away from things, that I did not comprehend just how dysregulated my nervous system was. And, you know, I think it's really challenging for creatives like you and me and everybody listening You know, and even if you're a small business owner and you don't consider yourself a creative and an artist, your business is your art. And as a, you know, small business owner, you're creating something. I didn't like slowing down is terrifying when you're creative because there can be this manic stressed out energy that's part of the creative process. And so it was very foreign to me during the pandemic to not be able to run somewhere. I mean, I literally could not go to get a cup of coffee or go to catch a flight or run to Target to run an errand, which I didn't realize was how I was kind of managing all of this dysregulated kind of survival mode energy. But learning how to stand in that frenzy, put my hands on my heart and bring myself back into my body so that I could leverage the intense and incredible power of my brain and be strategic instead of reactive and be confident instead of like chaotic, it's been life-changing. And so I believe that, look, you know, well, putting your hands on your heart, take away your problems. No, it won't change the circumstances you're dealing with. But what it does is it changes you from the inside out and changes your ability to be calm and to be confident and to be clear-minded and intentional about how you face those things. And that changes everything. Everything. Because shit happens. Shit's going to happen. And it's not that we aim to prevent things from happening, but we take control of our response to those things, right? Whether Mm -hmm. this is stoicism or neurology or psychology, all of those things align to say that how we respond is the measure of greatness, right? That is how we become our best self. And of course, sanity. This is, I mean, I, I yeah. give you an example, Chase. I so we just ha- we've been wrapping up kind of like this big like book tour to the extent you can do one in in these times. And I went over to London, and we had an incredible you know tour over in London. And I took my daughter with me, and it was time to come home. And the regulations for getting any kind of international travel, at least right now at the time that we are filming this, are mind-blowingly complicated and they're changing in real time and some involve printouts and others involve apps. And so I found myself at 4.30 in the morning at the airport two days ago with my daughter and we didn't have the right paperwork. And As soon as we learned we don't have the right paperwork, as soon as you start to entertain, I'm not getting out of this country. As soon as you learn that, oh my God, am I going to have to quarantine here for 14 days? Then can I get back in the country? Oh my, like, and that whole thing happens when you allow the stress of your life or the stress of a moment or the uncertainty of something or the fear that you feel to all of a sudden surge through your body, you will not be able to solve the problems you're facing. And so literally at 4.30 in the morning at Heathrow, I got my hands on my heart as I'm huffing and puffing because I didn't download the app and I can't get back home and I don't want to stay here for another 14 days. And my daughter started, I'm, I'm okay. 
I'm safe. I'm loved. I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm loved. My daughter's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm loved. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm, and I bring myself back into my body. And then I start saying, what if it all works out? What if everything's okay? What if I figure this out? And I use the tools to come back into the moment chase so that I can focus on what I need to do. And I'm telling you, if you're a small business owner and you are rattled and you are living with sustained stress, it's hand to hand combat with yourself in order to fight against the way that your body, your nervous system, your emotions can hijack you and you can get control. And the more you use the tools that we're going to talk about, the faster and better you'll become at it. Okay, how many procrastinators are in the room? Raise your hand. And everybody else is just <laughs> procrastinating on raising their hand. <laughs> I'm about to change your life because this piece of research changed mine. Procrastination has nothing to do with work. The people that write to us the most that struggle with procrastinating, PhD students, engineers, entrepreneurs, people that have a lot on their plate, that have a lot of things that they need to juggle and that are analytical and thinkers by nature. Procrastination is a form of stress relief. What are you stressed about? Bingo, and it makes you upset, doesn't it? Yeah. How many of you can relate to that? She said that what's stressing her out is she wants to retire, she hasn't saved up enough money. What's really stressing you out is finances and money and the fear that you have. But what happens when you struggle with procrastinating, and thank you for being so honest, there's that stresses you out. Maybe you feel the same way. I mean, we felt that way. I know exactly what you're talking about. You carry around this dark cloud because you don't think you're gonna make it and you're stressed about money all the time. Or maybe your mom's health is declining and that really stresses you out. Or maybe your best friends are going through a divorce or you're going through a divorce and that really stresses you out. And so you walk around with this big ass thing on your shoulders all the time. And then you walk into work and you sit down and you've got a list of phone calls to make which requires your prefrontal cortex and your prefrontal cortex looks at the list and is like, oh my God, you want me to make 15 phone calls? I've been worried about the money all day. Can we just look at cat videos? I need a break. And next thing you know, two hours is gone. You've been online shopping, you've been looking at cat videos. And then of course you look at the 15 phone calls, you're like, I didn't make them, I didn't make them, I didn't make them. The research on procrastination is undeniable. It's black and white. Number one, all of you that procrastinate, procrastination is not the issue, it's stress. You're procrastinating to give yourself a little break at work. It's sort of like taking a smoking break almost, you know? You're just taking a break. So number one, because you're all stressed out and procrastinators are very hard on yourselves, this is gonna sound super stupid, but you gotta forgive yourself. You have got to actually have a talk with yourself where where you feel yourself starting to procrastinate, you go, look, you know, I really screwed up. I know I'm in a mess financially. I forgive myself. I'm just gonna do the best that I can. So you have to address the thing that's underneath it. So that self-awareness of knowing, oh my God, here's that stress again about finances, screwing me over and preventing me from doing the small things that will actually fix my finances. Second thing that you're gonna do, procrastination's a habit, right? You get triggered by stress, the habit is to procrastinate. So when you get triggered by stress, your new habit is, oh, there's my stress again. I'm gonna actually tell myself, okay, you've done the best you can. It's okay, we're gonna do a little bit today. You're gonna create what we call starting ritual. A starting ritual is something that pushes you to start. The best one on the planet, the five second rule. So you've said, okay, there's my stress again. I forgive myself. Now we're gonna five, four, three, two, one. I want you to only work for five minutes. That's it, five minutes. Make phone calls for five minutes. Here's what we know based on the research. 80% of you will keep going. The trick is starting. You see, I want to break the connection between the trigger, which is stress, and the response, which is procrastination. And whenever you feel stress, which is normal, you have a choice. Here's that gap. In five seconds flat, the habit of procrastinating and beating yourself up will take over. Or you can close the gap, five, four, three, two, one, and you can make a different choice. I'm just gonna get started. I'm just gonna be okay with where I'm at, and I'm just gonna get started. Got it? And I want to tell you the three sources of the resistance that we've 
identified, and there's probably even more, but I want you to know this is very, very common. First of all, for those of us that have experienced trauma or abuse or neglect or discrimination or poverty or all kinds of heartbreak, abandonment, anything that you have survived, a lot of us drag that into the bathroom every morning and it stands between you and the person in the mirror. And you see it as evidence that the person you're staring at, if you'll even look at them, is damaged or unworthy or whatever you say, unlovable. And so the resistance is this deep seated belief that because of those things that you've survived, you do not deserve the high five, which is where the resistance comes from. So I'm here to tell you if that resonates for you, the high five is a beautiful thing because you don't need to say a word. You can feel all that resistance. That's okay. Because the physical gesture and the programming in your mind do all the work for you. And, you know, if you have survived all those things in your life, you not only deserve a high five, you need one. And you need one to heal because, you know, if you can think about the times where you have given or received a high five, Dr. Nicole, what does the gesture communicate whenever you give it to somebody? I think high fives communicate acknowledgement, right? You see that person and you feel I'm gonna use some version of favor. You're celebrating some aspect mm -hmm. of what they're doing. Yeah. It's like, I love you. I see you. I believe in you. Keep going. If somebody's having a bad day, shake it off. You got this. And you've never in your entire life high five somebody and thought, I hate you. I hope you lose. <laughs> You're the worst. You, you can't do it. Like, so if you can stand yeah. there and say that person in the mirror is unlovable, but the second that you raise your hand to high five yourself, your brain takes over. And so does your nervous system because they know what a high five means. So it is impossible. Try it. Try it. You cannot high five yourself and actually think something terrible about yourself because your brain neurologically won't allow you because of the programming in there. It's like trying to sing the lyrics to a different song while Let It Be is playing. You can't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in your mind. And so the more that you make this a daily practice, what ends up happening is you silence the critic and the programming associated with the high five starts to marry with your own reflection. Now, another thing that happens is like form of resistance is all the regrets that you have and the shame that you carry. So if you're human, you have done things that you deeply regret, whether it's cheating or lying or addiction or hurting others or hurting yourself, all stuff that you did, by the way, while you're trying to survive. Mm -hmm. Things that you would gladly forgive Dr. Nicole or Mel Robbins for, but you drag it into the bathroom every morning and you use that as evidence again to see a person that is not worthy of celebration because of those things this was actually a really big insight because of chris my husband when he got out of the restaurant business the restaurants uh that he and his best friend opened ultimately shut down and it was interesting to watch that happen because when they shut down his business partner looked at the seven-year experience and was like it's restaurants you know i'm really proud of what we did we worked hard. We did a good job. Like we were great employers. Like we had a great product. Okay. You know, whatever we, did we return the profit? Nope. Let's move on. Um, my husband couldn't do it. He could not do it. He had the classic experience of shame. The restaurant failed. I'm a failure. I did not know Dr. Nicole, how deep of a hole he had fallen into because of the masks that he was wearing, hiding his depression, probably not even present to the fact that he was experiencing depression. And then of course, once he started to realize that's what it was, feeling like there was something broken, he has for seven years stood next to me at the bathroom sink and looked in the mirror and seen a human being who's a failure. And when I first started doing this and I said to him, you know, I think you should try this, Chris. Like this has some crazy impact on me. I think this might help bring the light back in. And he said, the, the high-fiving yourself is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And as we unpacked what the stupid was, because I said, actually, Chris, I think the reason why you think it's stupid is because you don't think you deserve one. Mm -hmm. 
And that's the heart of the resistance. That you are standing in such profound judgment that you are refusing to give yourself the forgiveness and the acknowledgement and the support that you need to pivot and turn toward healing and moving your life in the direction you deserve to move it in. And what's great about the high five is you don't have to stand in front of the mirror and go, I'm great. You don't have to do that. And in fact, it wouldn't work because for years you've told yourself you're not. But the second, again, this is called neurobics. It's a whole field of neurological research. The second you apply that physical motion, your brain's programming takes over. It silences the beatdown and you go this. And it doesn't mean, yeah, it actually is compassion. It says, I see you. Yeah, the last seven years sucked, but I'm still here and I still love you and I still believe in you. It sends you into your day feeling like you have your own back. You know, the third form of resistance is what you and I know so well, because we've talked about it a lot. And this is one that, that comes up for tons of people. And that is, unless you've done something that deserves the high five, like you've hit the weight, you are the size pants, your hair looks good, you have the money in the bank, you're driving the right car, you're dating the right person, you're doing the right thing, your mom's, like whatever it is, the thing outside of you, unless that's happening, you don't think you deserve something. And, you know, when you flip it and you realize, no, your life is a marathon and we don't stand along the edge of a walkathon and a marathon with our arms crossed and go, mile seven. Do you see the pace you're running? I'm not cheering for you until you get to the finish line. And even then, I'll see what your time looks like. No, we cheer for people, clap for them, high five them every step of the way. And that's what you need to be doing to propel yourself forward. Your favorite sports teams, they don't start a game by standing around, Dr. Nicole, I saw your last book, it really blew. You know, I don't know how this one's gonna go. That's not how you start a game. You literally ground down in optimism. You ground down in partnership, in trust, in faith. And then you seal it with this positive energizing gesture that aligns you on that commitment. You send yourself into your day that way. And the final piece of research that's really exciting, and I bet you'll be able to even go deeper on this, is uh, Dr. Amen asked me, he said, so when you leave the bathroom, do you notice that you feel a little more energized? And I said, yeah, I'm assuming it's just because, you know, it's like, hey, yeah. You know, it's kind of cheesy. Is that what it is? And he said, no. He's like, Mel, no. He said, just what you said about emotion and energy. Our nervous systems are wired for vitality. They have celebratory energy encoded in them. And so there are all these gestures you've done forever, whether it's celebrating somebody scoring where you raise your hands or crossing the finish line or raise your hand to wave hello or raise your arms to hug somebody or raise your arms to high five. The reason why you feel your vitality come back is because your nervous system also recognizes the gesture. So you get dopamine, you get the positive programming, and you get this little boost of celebratory energy that comes through your system to lift you into the day. I cannot wait to bring on fitness coach Peter, who is losing his motivation over in Ireland. So let's see what he has to say right now. Hello there, Mel, team, and the phenomenal community. I'll stay connected. Um, my, my name is Peter, and I'm dining in from the Republic of Ireland. And I've got this question based on today's uh, live stream topic, uh, positivity. Uh, I'm a fitness coach, and I feel like I've been inspiring, motivating, teaching how to deal with different obstacles, um, my clients, my family, but on most days, especially now, I am feeling I'm losing the ground under my own feet and I'm struggling with finding um, that constant flow yeah. of positivity. So my question is, how can I find that balance uh, within my own? So thanks very much um, for everything you do. Stay blessed, stay well. Thank you again. All right, so there are a couple things about the question. First of all, Peter, thank you so much for sending your question all the way from Ireland. And 
you said a couple things that jumped out of you. You uh, are losing the ground underneath you and you are seeking advice about how to stay motivated consistently. So here's what I want to do. I want to put this in the language that you as a fitness coach will certainly appreciate, but you watching, this is for you too. You're training for this moment. And Peter in particular, somebody who has been motivating people, who has been training people to be physically fit, you have been training for this moment your entire life. And you got to view this moment like a test. And what is the test testing? It's testing who you are. That's part of the race right now, how you show up for it, right? It's not a matter of how you finish it. It's how you show up for it and what you do while you're running it, the kind of racer that you are. And look, I get it. This is a very difficult race that we're all running because we don't know where the finish line is. And it is very, very hard to stay motivated, which is the advice that you're seeking, Peter, when you don't even know when this damn thing is ending. This is the part of the race. I've run four marathons. Don't everybody gasp. I mean, it was nothing to uh, to brag about. I mean, I finished them, which is which is something to brag about, but it's not like I won the damn thing. But this is the point in time when you're running a race, when you said you're losing ground. What that means is you're starting to slow down. You feel your legs getting heavier. You feel your breath getting a little bit more shallow. You start to wonder, oh shit, I, I, why did I sign up for this thing in the first place? You start to wonder if you are going to make it. And so here's what I'm gonna tell you, Peter. When you are coaching your clients and your clients start to lose ground, when you are coaching your clients and your clients don't feel motivated and they feel tired and they feel like giving up and they don't wanna do another set of burpees, what do you tell them? You tell them to dig deeper. You tell them to find the strength within them to keep going. You see what you need right now is you need to start building the motivation of your mind because motivation doesn't exist in your body it comes from up here. And what I hear is that you now have an opportunity. This is what the test is, Peter, to train harder because you are capable of so much more. This is handing you a moment where you get to become an even stronger and more capable version of yourself. Now, does that mean that you're gonna be motivated all day long uh, every single day that you wake up? No, but it means you've got to have the mental fitness right now to continue to get up, to show up, and to dig deeper when it comes to your mindset, when it comes to your attitude, when it comes to your just knowing that you are going to get through this. And so this moment, everybody, it's telling you who you are. It's telling you whether or not you're the kind of person that shows up to a challenge and you're pissed off or you're sad or you feel depressed or you feel despair or you feel all of these things that start to take you down the drain of negativity. And what I'm here to tell you is that you are built for this moment. You may not feel like it. You may feel sad. Those are all normal feelings. You may feel negative. It's very easy to do. You may start to feel a little bit of despair. That's going to come and go. But this is where the test of this race that we're currently running lies. When those feelings rise up and you start losing ground and you start feeling like you're not going to make it to the finish line and you start feeling unmotivated, can you dig deeper and remind yourself that you were built for this moment? Because one of the things that I know is that when the shit is hitting the fan, I guarantee you there are people in your life that are looking to you. There are people in your life, whether it's clients or colleagues or family members that are looking to you right now. You know what that tells me? That you're the kind of person that people rely on. And now is the moment in time in the race that we're all running where you got to teach yourself to rely on yourself. How do you do that? How do you build the muscle of the mind? It's very simple, very simple. I didn't say easy. I said simple. 
The steps are very simple. To win this race and to build strength in this muscle right up here, you got to focus on the shit you can control. And that is what you do with your body and what you do with your mind. And the one thing that has made a huge difference in me, because you can see that I am showing up as a very different Mel Robbins than I've been the last couple of weeks. The last couple of weeks, I have been losing the race. I've been going up and down. I've been doing my best to stay positive, but I am now back in the race. I have now found my ground and found my footing. And it comes in focusing on what you can control. And you know what you can control? There's only one thing. It's what are you doing to make this day, the best day that you can do. What are you doing to master this day today? Fuck tomorrow. Forget about next week. Forget about what's happening this summer. This is a race that will be won by those of you who are the ability to focus on today and making today amazing. And so you know what I did today? Today, I did something I haven't done since the beginning of this quarantine. I got up an hour earlier than I normally do. Why? Well, because I noticed that throughout my day, I was feeling behind. Throughout my day, even though I was waking up, even though I have a morning routine, even though I was getting stuff done, I felt, even though I was doing all those things somehow behind. And I realized that in order to master my day, in order to be fully in control of what I'm gonna do today, I gotta make sure that when my ass hits this chair at 9 a.m. and my workday starts, I have fully taken control of everything that puts my body and my mind first. And when I was honest with myself, about why I was losing ground and why I wasn't feeling motivated and why I was starting to feel my own energy cycle down. It was because I was not taking the time in the morning to give myself the mental prep and training and the physical prep and training so that I could make this day, today, April 14th with everything that I got. And so that's what you need to do. And that's what, Peter, you need to do, too, over there in Ireland. You need to remind yourself of who you are. You are a person who has been training for this moment your entire life. This is a race where you do not see the finish line, which means you have got to focus on today. You have got to focus on what you can control. And the only thing we can control is what our body is doing today and what we allow our minds to focus on. So the second your mind starts to go down that drain of, oh my God, what's going to happen? And, doo -doo 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 -doo, and this fall, and when's it going to end? And blah, 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 do, 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 do. And you feel yourself losing motivation and losing ground. We are done mourning this situation. We are done feeling sad about this situation. How about we give ourselves a collective bitch slap? We dig a little bit deeper and we show up for this situation. What else are you going to do? Feel sorry for yourself, lick your wounds. It's so much better when you decide to dig deep and you decide to show up. That's what I'm gonna do. Um, some days it's gonna be harder than others, but that's the whole point of getting stronger. Reminding yourself that you are capable of so much more and all of the emotions that you're feeling and all of the excuses that you're feeling, it's all normal, but it's a choice as to whether or not you listen to them. So Peter, Keep me posted on how you're doing. And for you watching this, I hope that this gives you the kick in the ass that you need to shake that negativity loose and to rise to this moment and start working on the things that you can control, your mind and your body. And in case nobody else tells you today, I'm gonna tell you, I love you, I believe in you. I don't care how tired you are. I don't care how sad you are. I don't care how overwhelmed you are. Get your shit together because this is the new reality. And you can make today a better day by focusing on what you can control. And I'm going to be here every day, annoying, as positive as I can be, to push you to remember that. And if you're wondering, how the hell do I get on this and get this motivation from Mel and ask her a question and get the tough love that I need and 
seize the opportunity in this moment, just text your question. See the phone number below? That is our texting community. Get yourself on it. Ask a question. When you text it, there will be something that comes back to you. You got to reply in order to opt in. Ask the question. That way my team can reach out to you. You could find yourself on a future video. How about that? All right. You go have a great day and dig a little deeper today. So let's talk a little bit about procrastination. Who in here struggles with procrastination? Yeah, and the rest of you that aren't raising your hand are just procrastinating on doing it, aren't you? I know. You see, I always thought procrastination had to do with the thing I was procrastinating around, right? Like that procrastination has something to do with work. Believe it or not, procrastination has nothing to do with your work. Procrastination is a form of stress relief. Let me explain this. So let's say that you've got some stuff going on in your life, and heck, who doesn't have stuff going on in your life? Maybe you're fighting with your significant other. Maybe mom's or dad's health is failing and it's really, really upsetting you. Maybe you've got some financial stuff. You put too much of your savings into Bitcoin and now that that's crashed, you're stressed out about it, right? And so you go into work and when you get into work, you got stuff to do. You kind of walk in and you got this big stress ball that uh, subconsciously is hanging over your head. And so you walk in and you sit down and you know you got 13 phone calls you need to make. And you also know that you've been chickening out, you've been making easy calls and there's a bunch of CIOs or other people that are higher level that you haven't been calling. And so as you sit down to do it, and you got the stress on your shoulders, your brain it starts to go, wait a minute, well, you want me to make a call to somebody that I'm scared to make? Absolutely not. I'm so stressed out about, can we just watch some cat videos for a minute? And next thing you know, an hour's gone by. And then, of course, what do you do? You beat yourself up. So the only way that you can break this habit, and that's an important word for you to hear, you're not a procrastinator. You have a habit of procrastinating. Big difference. Because if it's a habit, I can teach you to use science to break it. You see, all habits have three parts. There's a trigger. And in the case of procrastination, the triggers always stress. Then there's a pattern you repeat. And in the case of procrastination, it is to avoid doing something. And then there's a reward. You get a little stress relief. The only way to break a habit, you guys, is not to deal with the triggers. You're never gonna get rid of the stress in your life. But you can 100% change your pattern of avoiding work. So next time that you're in a situation where you feel yourself hesitate, you spent way too much time checking out the highlights from last night's scores, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go, oh, I must be stressed out about something. Acknowledge the stress. Then go five, four, three, two, one. I want you to count to yourself because I want you to interrupt the habit that's stored here and I want you to awaken your prefrontal cortex. Then I want you to just work, just for five minutes. The reason why I want you to only work for five minutes is because your problem isn't working. It's the habit of avoiding. I just need you to start. And here's the other cool thing. We know based on research that if we can get you to start, 80% of you are going to keep going. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have to confess something to you. I am procrastinating right now. I'm stressed out, I'm overwhelmed. My manuscript is due in a matter of 24 hours or so. And um, look, I'm even losing my train of thought in this video. And instead of working on the manuscript, I am, uh, I've become a passenger to my stress and my stress has triggered me to take on a project. <laughs> See this fridge? It would be empty. It has no shelves remaining in it because I thought the day before my manuscript is due, maybe you should spend a couple hours pulling the refrigerator apart, take everything out, put it on the counters. Why not hand wash all of the shelves there for the fridge? Because you know, that's gonna help you with the manuscript. Oh, and the, you know, the piece of glass, that's gonna help you with the manuscript that is right here that needs your editing, Mel. Oh my God. You know, it's so funny because the book that I'm writing, it's so awesome. I can't wait for you to read it. It's called The Five Decisions. And it's about the five decisions that put you in the driver's seat of your life. Because on the road of life, there are passengers and there are drivers. And 
at any moment you can choose to be one. Um, either a passenger or a driver. And right now I'm a passenger to my stress. And the key to being a driver in your life is recognizing when you get hijacked by old patterns, when your stress and your uncertainty and your anxiety kicks you into autopilot mode and you distract yourself <laughs> and engage in patterns of behavior, like avoiding what you need to do. You know, interesting thing about procrastination is it's a form of stress relief because if I'm stressed out about the manuscript in the dining room that needs final editing, one way to avoid having to deal with what stresses me out is to procrastinate and find something else to do. Find something that lets your brain take a break from the thing that's hard, the manuscript that I need to be editing right now, and give your brain a break and relax by doing something like emptying out your entire fridge, washing all the stuff in the sink. So what do you do when you realize you've become a passenger to your stress? How do you get back in the driver's seat? Well, number one, you gotta recognize what you're doing. Number two, don't make yourself wrong. You're human. You're gonna go back and forth between being a passenger and a driver all the time. Number three, the second you realize that you've just been hijacked, you have a choice. You can continue to clean out the fridge. <laughs> Oh, look, I haven't taken the trash out either. Oh, and isn't that nice? I've, my ADD is on fire today. Um, number three, you've got a choice. You can continue to procrastinate. Choose it, enjoy it. Or you can interrupt the fact that you're being carried away by it. And you can, five, four, three, two, one, I'm gonna quickly put all this crap back in the fridge and I'm gonna get back to the thing that I've been avoiding. Because the longer I avoid this, the more stressed out I'm gonna feel. Anyway, I got a manuscript to um, edit. We all procrastinate. We avoid the things that we know that we need to do and then we spend the rest of the day beating ourselves up. It's amazing. Actually, it sucks, doesn't it? So how do you stop procrastinating? Oh, simple. Just nail yourself to a chair. That's what you do. You tell yourself no booze until you get it done. That works. No, it doesn't. The reason why these things don't work is because most of us don't even understand what procrastination is. I know I certainly didn't. The reason why you procrastinate is not why you think. Procrastination has nothing to do with work. Procrastination is a stress reliever. That's right. It's a tool that you use to give yourself relief from stress that you feel. And the stress that you may be feeling right now might be stressed about money. You might be stressed about your health. Maybe you're stressed about something going on at work or about a relationship that you're in. And the way that this relates to procrastination is you're stressed out, you got work you know you need to do, but instead of doing it, you go online or you watch the highlights of last night's game or you waste an hour looking at Facebook. And when you do that, when you avoid work, it makes you feel good but just for a minute. See, this is where we get procrastination all wrong. A lot of people think procrastination is about willpower. It means that you're lazy. It has nothing to do with that. It's all about your stress. That's why your work ethic or discipline, that's not, that's not gonna solve this either. The key to stopping procrastination, number one, is understanding what it is. It's a way that you deal with stress. And number two, it's about five second decisions that stop the cycle of procrastinating. Because when you change your decisions, you're gonna change everything. And here's how you're gonna use the five second rule to do it. When you catch yourself procrastinating, or you feel yourself starting to avoid what you need to do, use the rule. Five, four, three, two, one, activate your prefrontal cortex, and then acknowledge. Acknowledge that you feel stressed out. That's the first piece then you're gonna use the five second rule to just get started. That's it, for five minutes, that's all I'm asking. Force yourself, I'm stressed out, I get it, but I'm gonna work for five minutes. Five, four, three, two, one, sit down and get started. After you've worked for five minutes, give yourself a break. Watch all the cat videos you want, I don't really care. The point here is that this is a way that you can use the five second rule in combination with research about beating procrastination that puts you in control of your decisions. 
Stacy found that when she used the five second rule to improve her relationship with herself, there was an amazing result. She stopped procrastinating. In her words, your rule has helped me grow in ways I never thought possible. I no longer procrastinate on anything. And the same is going to be true for you. Because when you understand that procrastination is something that you do when you're stressed, and you also understand that the secret to beating procrastination, which is a habit, is to just get started, now you can use the five second rule to leverage all the research that will help you end the habit of procrastinating once and for all. To learn more about the science behind why this works, why just getting started is the key, and all of the science behind it, I want you to read chapter 11 of the five second rule book. And it's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and at your local bookstore. If you expect to achieve your goals, if you expect to reach your potential, if you expect to have your dreams come true, what I'm about to explain to you is mission critical. You must become a master at visualization. Now, for those of you that are like, what the heck is she talking about? I did not sign up for some sort of meditation, woo-woo, spiritual thing here. Don't worry. This is Mel Robbins. There's always science and research involved in everything that I talk about. So visualization is a extraordinarily powerful skill. And you may have heard of the law of attraction. You may have heard of the word visualization. You may have heard of the word manifesting. I call it um, seeing signs. So I'm a master at seeing positive signs. I am a master of creating coincidences. I have the world's most incredible luck. You want to know why? Because I understand the science and the skill of visualization. I know that your brain, it is a gigantic detective machine. Your brain is a filter. Your brain is constantly looking for evidence. And that's good news. It's good news when you know how to use it to your advantage. Let me explain. So your brain has a system in it. Here's the technical term. It's called the reticular activating system. It is a network of neurons all up in here. And what is the job of the reticular activating system? It is a filter system. It's basically a system that allows certain information in your brain and it blocks out other information. And guess who programmed that filter? You did. And so did the people from your past. And so if you constantly feel like you're unlovable, guess what? Your reticular activating system is going through the day and it is going to point out every single piece of evidence that confirms that negative belief that you have. If you think that people don't like you at work, the reticular activating system, the filter, it is literally going to be looking for evidence to confirm that belief all day long. This is one of the reasons why we have such a problem with politics in this country. This is why there's something called a confirmation bias. Confirmation bias means your mind loves to read things that you agree with because reading things that you agree with confirms your filter. Why do we have a reticular activating system? There's a really important reason why you have this. The reason why is if your brain let in everything. Have you ever looked at a Facebook page have you noticed how many words are on a standard Facebook page and the ad over here and the ad over here and the ad over here and the ad and the zoo seed right here and the stuff up here and the, all this over here? If your brain took in everything at equal value, your head would literally explode off your shoulders. Your brain would melt down. And so the reticular activating system protects your brain by filtering information and only letting in stuff that it agrees with. So. That's the scientific reason and mandate for why you got to get busy reprogramming that thing. 
Because if you live like I have lived for a very long time, one of the beliefs that I had, and we're going to be talking about this a lot this month, one of the beliefs that I had for a very long time is that I was a bad person, that I was not lovable, that um, I did not deserve to be a good person, that people didn't think I was a good person. And consequently, that led me to do a lot of hurtful things to myself. It led me to do a lot of hurtful things to uh, people that I cared about. And it, it really damaged decades of my life. And I believed it. I believed it and it drove my actions and I saw evidence everywhere. If you're going to do a mindset reset, you've got to change what you believe about yourself. And so for those of you that had a very negative uh, assessment of 2018 and you're feeling down about your goals already as you look at 2019, you have a very negative belief system about yourself. And that's going to stop right now because now we're going to talk about visualization and how you use it in order to start to reprogram the reticular activating system in your brain so that your brain starts to spot opportunity. Your brain starts to spot evidence that things are working out. Your brain starts to spot coincidences so you can build momentum. And it begins with visualization. So as you take your goals, right? So you've written down all these goals, right? For 2019, I want you to go to each one and I want you to do a visualization exercise. And here's how you're going to do it based on science, because there's a particular way you have to do this based on science. Okay. It's a two-step method. So if let's take self-worth because we had a question about self-worth. If your goal is to improve your self-worth, I want you to visualize what your life looks like and how you're going to feel about yourself when your self-worth has improved. Here's how you're going to do it. So there's two things that you have to do when it comes to visualization. You have to close your eyes. Truly, I know it sounds stupid, but I want you to close your eyes and I want you to, in your mind, have a specific picture of what it looks like in your life when your self-worth has improved. You're going to see yourself speaking up at work. You're going to see yourself talking more about your business. You're going to see yourself leaving bad relationships. You're going to see yourself defining boundaries. You're going to see yourself going to the gym. You're going to see yourself uh, taking care of yourself. And when you start to visualize the image of that, I want you to consciously, this is step two, consciously think of the positive emotions that you're going to feel. I'm going to feel happy. I'm going to feel proud. I'm going to stand taller. I'm going to be so grateful that I made this change. Marrying the, the specific picture. Oh, there I am. There I am. I'm, I'm, at, I'm at work and I'm raising my hand. Amazing. I'm sharing my idea. There I am. I'm getting a promotion. There I am asking for a raise. There I am. I've just signed up another customer to my business. There I am. I've gone back to school. I feel so good about myself. When you do that, here's what's actually happening in your brain. This is the cool science part. You are training your brain to have a totally different filter. You see, your brain, my brain, it doesn't know the difference between something that actually happened to you, like the F you got in your test in 10th grade, and the things you imagine that are happening to you. Let me say that again. Your brain doesn't know the difference between the bad things that actually happened to you, the real memories that you have, and an imagined memory that you're creating. Your brain will experience you visualizing going to the gym, you visualizing how happy you feel when you do, you visualizing asking for that raise and getting it and how proud you're going to feel. Your brain, when you visualize in the way that I'm teaching you to, it, it encodes it as a real memory. And that's important because when you encode it as a real memory, it changes the filter system, that reticular activating system. And here's what we know based on research. The more you visualize things, number one, the greater your confidence is going to be, the greater security you're going to have about it. And here's the really cool thing. 
the more you do this with your goals, you wake up every day and you just visualize for, it takes 30 freaking seconds for crying out loud. You visualize having a great day at school. You visualize curing your panic and how proud you're going to be. What studies suggest and have proven is that simply visualizing yourself doing things actually develops the skill and helps you improve the skills just as if you were actually doing it. And so there's proof based on research that visualization helps you build skills. And then finally, the other thing that's really important about this is that the more that you do this, what we know based on research is that the reason why you start to believe what you think is because you are reprogramming your brain. You are changing the network of neurons that act as a filter. And so the more that you actually believe in yourself and you start thinking and visualizing yourself speaking up, the more confident you're going to become, the more skills that you're building, and you're actually going to do it. And then instead of looking for all the reasons when you're sitting in a meeting to not speak up, you're going to just speak up because you're going to have changed the filter. You're going to look for opportunities. This is how it works. This is why this is so incredibly important. Here's why I'm doing this because I know the single thing that's holding you back is how you think you have the ability to set goals. You have the ability to take the actions that change your life. You have the ability to have the conversations that scare the hell out of you. You have the ability to end relationships. You have the ability to write a book. You have the ability to do a Google search. You have the ability to change anything you want. But the only reason why you don't is because your mindset blows. And so day one, I want you to go through all the goals that you set. And I want you every single day throughout the next 30 days, you are going to spend 30 seconds. Your dreams deserve 30 seconds, don't you think? You're going to close your eyes and you're going to visualize what does it look like in your life when you have achieved your monetary goals this year? How does it feel to go to the bank and see that balance? How does it feel to be able to write that check and take your kids to Disney World on money that you made? How does it feel to be able to rent your own place or put down a down payment for the house you've always dreamt of? How does it feel to be able to have saved enough money so you can quit the job that you hate and launch the business because you have achieved your goals? It feels darn good. That's how it feels. And I want you to just savor that because what you're doing when you visualize is you're reprogramming your reticular activating system, that system of neurons, that network that acts like a filter in your brain so that it's spotting opportunity, so that it is helping you see evidence that you are confident, that you are capable, that you can do this instead of all the garbage you think right now. The answer really is already in you right now. Of course it is. Like if I were to ask you, Peter, hey, Peter, I was bankrupt and uh, I was fighting with my husband all the time and drinking too much. How could I change my life? What, what, what would you tell me to do? Yeah. Say, look for a job, Mel. Stop being a bitch to Chris. And uh, you might want to consider sobering up. The answers are easy. It's the actions that are hard. Instead of being addicted to information, which to me is a form of self-doubt, if you think you, if you need a credential because legally you can't own a nail salon without the license, get the credential. If you're getting a credential because you're scared shitless about selling yourself, it's time to start selling. Because the credential is not going to solve the self-doubt. The only thing that solves self-doubt is action. It's really that simple. And the other thing that we fixate on is you fixate on the big stuff. You got to start with the little stuff. You know, they did this massive research project at the Harvard Business School where they basically asked what makes people feel satisfied or successful with their, with their work. And after this monster study, they came down to one factor. Are you making progress every day on something that's important to you? You see, a mistake that we make is that we, we wait to feel ready to do something. So we have all this pent up energy and then we make a burst and we make 10 phone calls. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I'm like motivated. This is freaking amazing. And then, and then all of a sudden you're like, whoo, I'm done. Oh, and then you don't do it for a week. You are so much better off making one important phone call a day. So much better off because you're seeing yourself make progress on something every single day. And you're also not relying 
on these bouts of feeling motivated, which come and go like the breeze. How do I avoid busy action and only apply that to the right actions? She's just not sure what actions to take. And I'm sure you've been there as I have. What do you tell her? Well, so first of all, I think any action that you take is a good one, even if it's busy, right? So five, four, three, two, one, get moving, stop thinking, do what you need to do. When you notice that you're just focused on the busy stuff and your wisdom, your instincts are telling you you're avoiding the big thing, that's a moment of power. Five, four, three, two, one, go focus on the big thing. The other thing that's gonna help her is if every morning you, um, in those 20 minutes that you find for yourself before you look at the phone and you plan your day, come up with your priority for the day that matters to you, like some project you're working on, something related to your business, and then identify the one thing that you're gonna do that scares you today to drive the business forward. That's it. If you were to just do one thing a day that's outside your comfort zone with your business, you'll be shocked at where your business is six months from now. Just one. I'm not asking for big shit here. I'm asking for one thing. And do it even though you don't feel like it. So you didn't always know exactly what action to take. You were just taking action and adapting and adjusting along the way. No, I, I feel like there are some people in life that I think are like gifted with OCD or like on the spectrum Ashburgery that are super like focused and they know exactly what they want and they can just march right towards it and that's how they go. I'm not like that. I have to stumble into things. So what happens for me is my instincts tell me something and then I go and take action to do it. And then as I'm doing it, I gather all this data, data that tells me I hate, oh, what the heck, hold on, this is CNN. We gotta decline that, tell them goodbye. Um, data data that, that informs me. I'm gonna give you an example, okay? So I had tremendous success, success in the speaking business. My, I went from zero, never had been paid for a speech to literally the most booked woman in the world in three years flat. Crazy. And there's a number of reasons why. Number one, the content's terrific. I'm also a really good public speaker. There's not a lot of women on the circuit, but more importantly, I behave in a way because I know that the number one asset in business is make the people you're dealing with know that they matter. Take care of everybody you deal with, everybody. The event planners, the speaking bureaus, everybody has something that they're worried about. You get rid of the worry, you make them feel like they're important, everybody wants to be around you. Because at the end of the day, we all wanna know that we matter. So if you do business with people that make you feel good, you wanna do more business with them. And so it's a really, really simple thing. I call it my philosophy about human beings is just be a fan. Just cheer for everybody. There's so much success to go around. People have really difficult lives. They make things really hard for themselves. Make their life easy. Make them feel great. Give them a hug, smile, compliment them. Be generous. Don't be a pain in the ass. Like literally, it's that simple. So I explode. Now here's the thing. I thought when I started the speaking business that it would be really amazing to just for the rest of my life be a speaker. Here's what I discovered. There are so many aspects of running a speaking business at this level that deplete the hell out of me. I hate being alone. I hate traveling that much. I really don't like the fact that when I get off the stage, I don't have contact with the audience anymore. What in energizes me is conversations like this. What energizes me is hearing from people, connecting with them, the ongoing stuff. And so a year ago, I made a decision, I gotta shift the business. Now, it's already a really successful business, and you watching this, your business may be wildly successful too. Let me ask you a question. What aspects of your business energize you? And what aspects deplete you? There's an enormous business opportunity for you right now to simply align your business with the things that energize you more. So for me, that meant, hmm, how do I take this significant revenue and duplicate it, but not get on a plane? How do I reach people with these ideas and inspire them without having to be away from my family? How do I have an ongoing connection? Because those are the things that energize me. And so I made a huge pivot. We cut the number of speeches in half and we launched an online course business. We are now in the audio products business. And so that 
because it energizes me because I have an ongoing connection with you. The, the, other than talking to you, which is fucking awesome, hearing from everybody what they got out of this, seeing your photographs of you with the phone and five, four, three, two, one, and then getting the post that you actually closed a big deal. That is so cool because I see that you're changing. That is what is amazing. Now, here's the other thing, guys. Five years from now, it may deplete the hell out of me to do online courses. Something else, live events might energize me. So I will make that pivot. So when I said in the very beginning, Peter, there's only one you, and you've got this whole casserole of experiences and interesting wisdom, that depleted versus energized data is that wisdom. Use it to your advantage in business. If you freaking hate selling, hire somebody to do it for you. Pay attention to what your instincts are telling you. I'm not great at managing people. I don't have the patience to explain everything, you know? I'm not great with details in terms of production management. It depletes me. So don't do it. Find a partner, get somebody. Like, so this is what I'm saying. You may be banging your head against the wall, and the reason why you haven't hit that level is because you're scared shitless to hire somebody or partner with somebody or give up this aspect of your business that takes 80% of your time, gives you 20% of your revenue and depletes the hell out of you. Stop being stupid. Do the stuff that feels good, that's easy. That doesn't mean you won't have toilet days. That doesn't mean you don't have to do stuff like empty the trash or do the annoying things. We all have to. But align your business with the things that naturally energize you and you will explode your income. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.